So what are we going to do about this monster? Oh, we haven't talked to him. Right, because we got owned. What's Blood Sands? You don't seem fond of Estramorn. And this worries you? Is your role hereditary? Bog child? Say nothing. What will keep a word to do with the child? Uh, I won't do this. Goodbye. Fetch the Orland child from a house in Southeast Hearthsong. Now you can grab this child and just keep it, and the game recognizes that fact. Uh-oh, what's going on? A young man approaches us with a swift and purposeful stride. We've never met him before. He has the same stern, wild look as Siwok. He doesn't speak until he's right next to us. When he does, his voice is quiet. Wait, I saw you speaking with my father. What's this about? He glances back at the room with Simok. He's asked you to sacrifice Vila, hasn't he? Maybe he's right about Three Tusks, Stelgar growing weak. But if this is the price of strength, it isn't worth it. The tribes have survived this long because we've stuck together. He saw the Republic survive during the collapse of the Grand Empire. Had any of the great cities sided with the Empire, we would never have broken away. Did he just... Heravius looks at us with a puzzled expression across his face. Did a Three Tusks, Stelgar just say something wise? I do indeed live in strange times. A voice of reason. It's a wonder Simok didn't feed him to his Stelgars. Do you have another idea? I would never hurt the child. He sighs. It did not seem like one who would. But my father will find someone who will. He doesn't give up on an idea easily. He sighs. But there may be a way to stop him. He frowns. There's an herbalist among the ovates of the Golden Grove. Bleda, that's her name. They all gather southeast of here by the river. She could brew a poison. Simak wouldn't know the difference until it's too late. There's an easier way to kill Simak, you know. His warriors would surround you in no time. Besides, it's simplest if this happens quietly. Why not just return the child to her birth parents? It's complicated. A child sent to be fostered by another tribe isn't allowed to return. Unfortunately, explaining that we're shielding her from my father would make matters much worse for both tribes. You want me to, you want me to murder her father? No but it's easier than allowing him to murder this child. Let me guess. If Simok dies, you're next in line. It's not like that. The Rio have already determined that my soul isn't strong enough. Whoever follows my father, I won't be me. Serves him right. No, that's not serves him right. It's Simok's right. Fine, I'll poison your father. With another glance at Simok's chamber, he backs toward the door. Like I said, you'll find Blada in the Golden Grove. Good luck. The person we're looking for for Heravius is also in the Golden Grove. Those loads are getting long. We looked for someone, though, and we didn't find anybody who had anything to say to Heravius. Oh, wait. Leda is who we're looking for for the potion. I've heard that you can make certain poisons. She takes a deep draw on her pipe. Poisons? I only deal in tonics that heal and enlighten. She exhales a puff of smoke. Of course, many beneficial substances can be harmful when taken in great quantities, but that's just Wertha's way of keeping all things in balance. She leans against the winding tree trunk and ticks the items off on her fingers. Oh, there's plenty. Concentrated carolgolin, undistilled spider venom, rotten blood moss extract, cave coral mixed with skein bone. Uh, how about some undistilled spider venom? She stops counting and scratches her head. Why would you want something like that? Well, my friend Stilgar is dying, and he wants to ease the creature's passing. She frowns, her teeth clamped around the pipe. Poor thing. Here, take this. She gives us a vial filled with a dark fluid. It works slowly, but this will send him back to the cycle kindly enough. Just see to it that it doesn't get misplaced. Half that dose would kill an Amaw. She taps ash from her pipe into the grass. Was there anything else? Lies! Lies! Tamarin. Though his eyes are closed, his posture still, and the man before us keeps his head aimed at us, as if carefully following our movements. Hail to you. May your time in the Golden Grove be enriching. And hail to you, Autumn Orland, the man says with a bow to Heravius. Heravius' eyes widen in surprise, eye widens in surprise, and his one good ear stands on end. How many aura did you? The man's eyes remain closed, and he says with a smile, Tranquility begets a receptive mind. 
He opens his eyes, revealing brown irises clouded with the beginnings of cataracts. With my eyes open, I see your birth form. But when I look inward, and with this he closes his eyes again, I see the autumn Stelgar. Let her obvious talk. I don't know how you can sense it, but you're right about me being the Stelgar. How do you know about the beast? Why was I ostracized just for being able to assume its form? Is there a cure? Tamron smiles, his eyes remain closed. I know the beast is often sent by Galloin as a sort of trial. Many Anam father are tested by the Autumn Stelgar. Those bested and consumed by the beast have their soul torn from their bodies and lost for all time. So, my tribesmen were right. Eravius looks crestfallen, his posture slumps, his gaze drops to the ground. Are you saying I have such a terrible power? This must be some sort of, if your spirit form were a bee, would you be mystically compelled to make honey? Were it a bird, would you spend all day making nests? Tamron opens his eyes once more and looks Eravius up and down before wincing and shutting his eyes once more. I would have said again, perhaps. I'm saying that... It, I'm saying this is what your animal form resembles is no, the animal your form resembles is known to do. It seems you are eager to leap to your own conclusions. I would not normally advise one to speak with the circle at blood at, the, at blood sands, but given your circumstances, the etic knoll may prove insightful. Of insightful. <laughs> he turns and, with his eyes still closed, points to the northwest. Read the stone slabs carved by the druids of the blood sands. There are answers to be found, as well as more questions, but you must explore them for yourself. What exactly is written on these stones? Much of it is utter rubbish on the incessant need for sacrifice. His calm countenance wavers as he says the last word with a spit and a hiss. But amongst the dogma are a few bits of wisdom on Galloway. Your friend will understand. Is there more you can tell us? Only to trust in Galloway and in YL. Both have blessed you in their own difficult ways. I appreciate the attempt to lift my spirits or obvious grumbles, but that doesn't really help. He sighs and digs into his ear stump with his index finger. But he has a point. I shall trust Wilde with something to show me in the blood sands. Blood sands. You should trust in Arona's stewardship. Thano Theos, you have stayed true to our cause, Inquisitor, when so many others have not. For every heretic we confess, for every betrayer that b burns on our pyres, new sheep continue to flock to you over your exensios. But not you. I underestimated you in the beginning, but no longer. You honor me, Grand Inquisitor. It is not for honor that I summoned you today, but for duty. Too many of our own have confessed upon the wheel and the rack by the flame, and the flame. Too many of our faithful have had their minds poisoned by the Kratom Witch. The tide is against us now. We have but one option. Yavara's following must be exposed for what it is. She must confess her heresy before my court. How would we reach her? Not in Kratom, surely. Their lord has embraced her heathen faith and protects her with his army. But in Osionis, things would be different. The king of Osionis is a sinful man. We have helped him to see any error of his ways, and now he fears for his soul. He would pay any price for absolution. But how could we get Eovara to move to Osionis? Theos put his hand on our shoulder. You have already done much for the Inquisition. I wouldn't ask this if there were any other choice. Our sister, Eovara. Stelgar. The Blood Sands. Oh. Ooh, it's the... The two dryads of the Twin Elms. Two identical women seem to fade into view as they move away from the great trees that camouflage them. Their skin is tree bark, rigid and scaly, wreathed with a curling tangle of roots, buds, and blooms. Their hair hangs beneath the shade of serrated leaves like the drooping branches of the elms above, and the pupils of their eyes are encircled by hundreds or even thousands of concentric rings, as if to mark the accumulated wisdom of millennia. One of them extends a snarl of roots upward, uh, toward us that snakes and twists together to form something like an open hand, palm down. Turn around, flesh creature. Outsiders are not permitted to approach the elms. The other stares at us unblinking and her frown deepens, her face creaks. And as her frown deepens, her face creaks. Do you not feel it, sister? Something familiar. An ancient soul like the other one. Another defiler, no doubt. Let us fell him and be troubled no more. 
It would pay the debt to his predecessor. Hmm. So it would seem, Ruin, Rianwen. We must not hasten to judgment. I see a different motive here, different questions in these eyes. What of it, young trespasser? Is it as my sister says? Or are you here to stain this place with foul deeds? My business concerns the health of this land, and you would be wise to aid me. That may be, flesh creature, but I do wonder whether your intentions are quite so noble as that. Are you here for the land, or for you? He is here for Theosix Arcanon, that much is evident. The answer is yes, old one, we crossed paths with Theos not long ago, and we can tell you where he went, but I find it curious that anyone would seek him out, suspicious even. If we are to help you find him, I would know why. There's a problem, and he's the only one who can fix it. Stopping him might end Wideland's legacy. He must face justice for his transgressions. Yeah, let's end the legacy. So that is the reason he passed this way. This is low, even for the leaden key. I told you we should have confronted him, Sita. He has always been a poison. It would have been the last thing either of us did, sister. Who can be said to have ever gotten the better of Theos? Yes, but imagine how much fun it would have been. Can't you just picture him all strung up in vines like an angry puppet? Sita glance over at us, and then her expression changes as though seeing us for the first time. But that's not what this is really about, is it? You're bound to that man. I see it now. You are awakened. Your soul is awake, and something once buried deep now wells to the surface. Past overwhelms present, closes in around us. Our time has nearly reached its end. I just need to see Theos. I'm sorry to tell you this, but Theos cannot give you what you seek, nor can any man. An awakening cannot be undone, any more than your past can be. What's she mean? I thought Merwald said, Eloth's faith is rigid. This is permanent. We did not come down this road together to be refused passage by a pair of talking saplings. Madicho, there must be some way. This has all been for nothing, and I'm going to lose my mind. The soul is formless without a past to shape it. Did you truly expect to be able to wipe it away? No, but I hoped it would be something I could forget. I'd rather have tried to put things right. I would live with it if I could, that or kill the man who brought it up. I had to believe in something. I didn't have a choice. I'd rather have tried to put things right, whatever that means. A noble thought, but for the lifetimes that separate you from your pro- but for the lifetimes that separate you from your problems. However, as much as my sister speaks truly that there is no way back from an awakening, there may yet be a way forward. Would you agree, Sita? I would, with a way not so likely to end in death. You underestimate me. Or perhaps you underestimate your foe, old one. Where your soul is renewed in its ignorance with each span of your life, his only grows in cunning and resolve. The man Theos, you must already know by now. You are linked by a common past. Something about it lingers within you, festering, unresolved. What it is, I cannot see any more than you. And without that knowledge, your doom is certain. But were you to learn the source of this discord, perhaps it could be put to rest. Though it is equally possible it will trouble you as much now as it did then, and merely speed your condition to its end. My past comes to me in pieces. How do I unlock the rest? You might wait for it to come on its own, of course, but when it comes, it will replace your sanity's last breath. Such is the nature of your condition. Or you could learn it from someone who already knows. Theos, would he remember? It is said the gods made his memory perfect, that he may never forget his charge. If he ever knew, he still does. Not that he would tell you, of course. We have followed the right person for the wrong reasons, it seems. We have often seen be- we see it often beneath the elms, the soul dragging mind and body to unknown places for unfathomable reasons. You may have wandered into Theos' path many times, many lifetimes, without an awakening to show you why. The only thing that's certain is you did not find what you sought. You said you knew where he went. Sita nods, causing leaves to shuffle against one another. He has gone down beneath the tower, to a place older than we, where the people of Angwith once walked. He makes his way to the buried city, sun in shadow. May he stay down there and rot with what remains of his people. He may yet. He won't be returning the way he came, that much is certain. He opened a secret path in the tower's base and saw it destroyed behind him through some vile means. Is there another way to get to him? We know of one. On the burial aisle through the court of the penitents, Praethaemon. A shortcut, in fact. 
Don't be cruel, sister. The way my sister speaks up is not for the faint of heart. A great pit at the center of a forgotten court where faiths were judged in the place of crimes. To make it, to most, it is simply a gateway to death. With the help of the gods, it may take you where you want to go. What do you mean with the help of the gods? The pit is said to have been a means of judgment by the gods. Those cast into it are meant to die. It is that way that you must pass to reach sun and shadow. The court is old. We do not know much for certain. But it would seem only the gods themselves can grant passage. And what is it? No more than a ruin now. It is older than we. A place for the trial of heretics. We were not here to witness it. But at one time there was a group that refused to acknowledge the gods. Neither the first nor the last, of course, but these were numerous, and all put on trial for it. Those who did not repent were cast into the pit, and imprisoned below. The fall killed them, of course. The prison was not for people, but for their souls, and their sentences were eternal. It is said that many of the condemned repented and were permitted by the gods to ascend from the pit so long as they pledged their service to one of them. But these are old legends. How would I ever get the gods to help me? Behind us is Tyr Evren, said to pierce the shroud itself and a place of communion with all gods. If ever there was a time for prayer, you've found it. Who would I pray to? Any god you can, I should think. I would pray first to the gods you like best. I hope for your sake the feeling is shared. Is there no other way? None. How do I pray? Tyr Evren is also called the Hall of Stars, and the stars show us the allegiances of the gods. When stars are in conjunction, we know the gods they represent are aligned as well. You should choose a place to pray where you will be closest to those who want to hear you. If a god stands alone, you should pray to that god. If they band together, you should address them all. Choose your words wisely, for all gods expect proper homage, and none has patience for fools. So the only way to get through this pit is to pray for help? Not the only way. Just the only one that doesn't end with your body impaled on jagged rocks. I have other questions. What do you wish to know? How did you know I was pursuing Theos? The same way you are no doubt able to peer into the ether and experience the souls of others. It is something we are born with, some more, some less. A gift common to many creatures of the wilds. You share certain similarities with the man you pursue. For your sake, I pray they are few, and of no consequence. You mentioned that people come into these elms without knowing why. A soul has a will all its own. Its needs and its whims are seldom understood but they follow them all the same. There is something about this place that reaches beyond our understanding, something like a beacon. The elms have a way of uniting souls that have been seeking one another, with or without the owner's awareness. Sometimes it is for love, sometimes for vengeance, sometimes for peace. Often it is for no reason we will ever know. In your case, let us hope it is for peace or vengeance. I want to know more about the two of you. There is little to be said about us, for we are bound here, caretakers and defenders of this place. Our journey has been over time, but not distance, measured in observations, but not experiences. We have seen the elms grow tall. We have seen cities built, burned, and built again. The only constant has been the tower, a silent companion through the ages. You can imagine why this recent destruction has stirred my sister so. If you do nothing else, make the man pay for what he did here. Need to know about praying for the support of the gods. I have other questions. Farewell. Before you go, tell me this, old one. I'm curious. If you were to subdue your enemy, what would you do with him? What would give you peace? I need to destroy our histories may be put to rest. Nothing more. He must be destroyed. I would return to the wheel of life and death so that he may trouble me no more. I wish to undo the harm he's caused. You would need to have twice as many lifetimes as he to repair his savage work. Perhaps there are strides you can make. All the same, think on this matter. Be assured in your course. In the end, it may mean all the difference, not just to his soul, but to yours. And be warned. Some questions have answers that can never be learned. And it is those that trouble the soul above all others. May you find an answer to yours. Nice. The assassin at large, eh? The Council of Stars. We're gonna get to talk to the gods. That's pretty cool. Are you sure of what you claim? I hope the sacrifices would have waned. We can fight without spilling the blood of the innocent. With the frontiers again open, I assure you, we'll need all our war paint for the coming season. Every sacrifice gives us with the power to save lives many times over. Are you sure about that? Are you sure? A supplicant. 
There's no greater honor than dying for one's tribe. If some fall in battle, how is this different? These guys suck. A rabbit keeper garroshed. A dwarven man stands motionless near the roaring fire that lights the cavern. His sacrifice feeds the land supplicants. Come forth. A gust of smoke curls around him, licking the charred flesh that bulges on his forearms. They suddenly flex. Estramore, the dwarf holds his fist in a tight grip. Your kin doesn't come here to share with the tribes. What do you want? Tell me about Ethic Knoll. That's who we are, the dwarf picks on his scarred forearm. His guttural sigh mingles with the crackling of wood and bones behind him. As I said, Estramorin rarely visit our halls. Our order has thrived for generations. Before we came to Twin Elms, our rights fed the lands in the eastern mountains. Now we share blood for our Glanfath. Karost opens his palms. Strikes of red skin run through them like flames. To everything that must end, our sacrifices bring a new beginning. He looks up. We sustain what's to come. What's this place? The Glanfathans call this place Blood Sands. We call it home. The Etic Null have tended this land from within this cave since before the arrival of the tribes to Twin Elms. He crosses his arms. Be warned, Estramor. Bleed life to nurture it. Our sacrifices may strike you as savage, but the health of these lands depends on them. It is unseemly for guests to insult their hosts. Tell me about the sacrifices. He spreads his stocky legs apart and locks his forearms. Everything must die to return anew, Estramor. Through the sacrificial rites, we offer supplicants the honor of giving their most precious gift back to their brethren, back to the land. The dwarf lifts his fist, thick and mottled by red scars. The blood gives us strength. Even the Glanfathans have come to depend on the blood paint. They brim with power before battle, all thanks to the sacrifices of their kin. Goodbye. Remember, Estramore, you're a guest in these halls. Respect our ways, and we'll tolerate your presence among us. Mm. No. Talon. All of the Anamfatha have called upon the Ethic Knoll for red for war paint at some point. Yeah. I still want to murder you, though. Just four lockpicks? Weird. Inside this mushroom? I guess. Why not? Last time I played, I just killed all these folks. Um, hey, it's a hunter ban. Give me your coins. Tick no. Move Palagina up here. Just as the flesh one nourishes many, strength, great sac greatness requires sacrifice. Doo -doo. Oh. Something has failed to happen. It is supposed to happen. Hmm. At some point, uh. Radric is supposed to come back from the dead, but he hasn't shown up. We haven't been informed of it anyway. Essence within to nurture flesh and essence without to strengthen it. Each generation, Naravius reads from the Glenfoth and text, the Anamfoth must stand before the autumnal beast in judgment. He coughs uncomfortably and continues. The wise endure, passing on their strength. The weak are eaten, their souls ripped to pieces and lost for all time, removing such weakness from the cycle. Well, I guess maybe my tribe wasn't entirely wrong about my spirit being from some sort of soul terror. I suppose I was hoping to hear a different answer on the matter, but, but it's worth asking. In all your times walking in the Autumn Stelgar's form, how many souls have you destroyed? That I'm aware of? None, he says resolutely as his face turns red. I get what you're saying. I merely wear the form of the Autumn Stelgar, not in control of me nor the son of who I am. He lets out a long sigh and relaxes. For years I've been telling myself my tribe judged me unfairly. Guess they weren't completely wrong. Well, enough pontification for the moment, he says, patting down a cowlick of hair. I need to know more. Let's look at these other tablets. Hmm, when does Radric come back? Hmm. At the Celestial Sampling and Hearth Song. Or the statue can give us a letter from him, apparently. 
Archdruid Reston. Oh boy. A dwarven man stands on a raised platform. Beneath him, an elf lies prone on a stone table. As we get closer, we hear the dwarf speak in a gravelly monotone. As your blood flows, so shall your essence. Your life's energy shall feed the soil, and your soul's energy shall enrich the community. This is by your own choosing, supplicant. Yes, the elf's voice is high but even. The dwarf grips a hatchet with both hands and raises it over his head. He throws his shoulders forward and swings the weapon to the elf's chest, connecting with a meaty thump. Blood gushes around the blade, and the sacrifice's screams are in the air. Aravius' hands clutch his chest and his eyes widen in amazement. I did say I wanted to see the teachings of other druids, but I think I was imagining more dried herbs and chanting. They never did that in my circle back home. Never. Aloth's lips curl with disgust. This is why I prefer the wand to the blade. Despite his earlier agreement, the elf thrashes atop the stone table, his torso arching while his arms and legs remain tight in place. Meanwhile, the dwarf spreads his arms wide and allows blood to spatter his robes. When the elf is finally silent and still, the dwarf pulls his hatchet from the body and wipes it on his hem. These guys fucking suck! Streaks of red-brown blood and globs of tissue have worked themselves into the minute grooves of this stone. The dwarf wears crimson robes that are stained and streaked in dark patches. His faith is smooth but lacking youthful elasticity, as if the lines and wrinkles have been formed and erased many times over. He watches us with eyes like two black pits as he wipes his hatchet on his robes. Hail, Estramore. His voice is deep and rough-edged. It echoes like a river in an ancient cave. No one comes to blood sands without a purpose. What is yours? He murdered a man right there. He lowers his head. Your simplistic morals do not apply here, Estramore. Murder does not enter into it. The smooth skin at the corners of his mouth and eyes wrinkles for one brief instant. It was a sacrifice and one willingly entered into. The survival of all things depends on balance, give and take. This principle lies at the heart of all power. Expending something of value releases energy. Energy that can be channeled by those who know how. He tilts his head toward us. All kith, whether they or not they care to admit it, practice this. We take the leal of the land and the flesh of the beasts to live and we give our blood and sweat to propagate the things we desire. It sounds brutal. It gives us a reproachful croak. The world is brutal. Nothing is gained by closing one's eyes against it. Better to recognize these realities that they might better serve you. I invite you to explore our halls and speak with our supplicants. One can learn much by observing the sacrifices others are willing to make for a greater purpose. Perhaps you'll even consider making a sacrifice of your own. He opens one hand toward us. The creases and nails are darkened and brown. Not all of our sacrifices are ridden in blood, but the most powerful are. Reston's eerily smooth face is motionless as he watches us. Who are you? I am the archdruid of the Ethic Null. For centuries it has been my duty to guide our rituals and guard our knowledge. His black eyes glitter. It is work that requires a certain resilience, but it is not without its benefits. Tell me more about Ethic Null. We are a druidic quarter that has been in twelve twin elms since in within times. Our founders came from the White March seeking a place where we might practice our beliefs in peace, as it were. Unlike most of our grandfather and brethren, we seek answers in the world around us rather than in the teachings of the gods. We believe that all life has power, and that this power can be siphoned and conducted. We are not, as some suggest, madmen and murderers. All of our rituals are conducted with willing participants, and through methods that have been tested and refined over centuries. He nods, his black eyes shining. This allows us to create the war paint for which we are respected, if not loved. What's war paint? A special ungent binding raw essence to the wearer. It grants incredible advantages in combat and has made us indispensable to the tribes. Whatever they say about our practices, almost all of them have made use of our war paint at some time or another. A slow smile spreads across his face. Fascinating indeed how the most strident objections can be overcome by circumstance. I'd like to buy this war paint. Fucking rube. I'm no merchant elf. Talk to keep her word uh, She's around here somewhere, so they do sell it. How are you different from the ovates of the Golden Grove? A dry laugh rasps in his throat. Golden Grove. I remember when Arona came with that name. He gives us a darkly gleeful look. Used to be as green as the rest of the forest, you know. We're more similar than they'd like to admit. We both believe in achieving power without the double-edged aid of the gods. But their fantasy is pure creation something from nothing. They blind themselves to the fact that all life, from the mightiest dragon to the slimmest braided blade of grass, requires death. 
The greatest end requires the greatest sacrifice. Some sacrifices are too costly. Many agree with you, and many float from one life to the next, living out a finite stock of years and accomplishing nothing. I want to know more about your sacrifices. A guttural laugh rumbles from his throat. We merely believe that, in giving up something of value, the energy from that sacrifice can be diverted elsewhere. It's not so different from what folk practice all over the world. If you want to turn the soil, sail a ship, or move a cart, you must expend energy. He smooths his robes. But we're best known for our practice of kith sacrifice. This is the most potent form of sacrifice because it releases the most energy. We distill the essence of an entire soul into raw power that can strengthen the body fortify the soul, and extend life. Hundreds of years, huh? That's all I wanted to know. Rest in the early smooth face is motionless as he watches us. Um, we're looking for more tablets. Tablets. Oh, a secret. Traps! Plus 2% raw damage per wound for a monk. Speed. Plus three move speed. That's not as valuable in this game because things live longer. Um, Supplicas. Chanteur. Oh, the silent chanter eyes us steadily. Keeper. The halls of the weak. These halls are not for the weak of spirit. Our bravest sons and daughters fall not by their something. Heravius skims over the Glenfathen script, clears his throat, and reads aloud. Is not the water sacrificed unto the plant, and the plant sacrificed unto livestock, and livestock unto man? When the lesser soul is sacrificed to strengthen the greater, the whole of our family grows stronger. He looks at us with a furrowed brow. I suppose I get the argument we all have to kill and eat as constantly for that matter to live. This sounds like it's talking about the blood sands rituals. I wonder how or even if that's relevant to me. You wear the eye patch of Y.L., I thought you were supposed to love cryptic information like this. Aravius stares at us with a smile. Fair point. Well, wanted me to see this, so... What about it applies to me? His voice sinks and his face turns pale. Am I the lesser soul? Was being cast out of my tribe the sacrifice that made the greater stronger? I don't know. It sounds like they're trying to justify their practices of killing people. Come on, let's see what the other tablets have to say. That's two... Do you think there will be three, or more than three? They're so precious about the contents of their urns and their little mushrooms. Let's keep her word. Uh, she'll sell us war paint. The elderly dwarf blinks at us, not quite looking at us. Her eyes are pale and clouded with cataracts. Welcome to blood sands. It is rare for an Estramore sets foot in these caverns. Her sightless eyes fix on us as she tilts her head. What brings you here, wanderer? Tell me about it. She cackles. Already I have heard your questions bounce along these halls. You asked rested himself of our practices, did you not? This is the raw, bloody heart of Erglanfath, where some come to give their essence back to their people. Her dry lips bend into a sardonic grin, where others seek a noble escape from their trials. The legacy of the builders to the tribes is not merely Adra and stone, but a sense of community, and it is here that Glanfathans come to sacrifice what is most precious, even their own lives, to preserve it. What do you do here? I sell and maintain certain goods for the preservation of our order, and I perform some of our ritual sacrifices. How do they work? Like any worthwhile ritual, it's too complex to explain in detail. It involves clotting the supplicant's essence, binding it to their life's blood, and drawing it into a container or vessel. What are you selling? Nothing all that dramatic. Miscellaneous potions, flask of war paint. Uh, it just doesn't last for very long is the problem. If it lasted for two minutes, then we could potentially use it to fell a dragon, but 15 seconds is just not enough time to make a difference. I mean, maybe it would be... Uh, probably w the most useful thing would be something that really increased our accuracy. So we could start... Apparently what you're really supposed to do is land a bunch of ailments on the dragon, and then they can just keep rolling that way, because they stack. If you can land one, then it becomes easier to land the next, and you can just keep heaping them on, and that's how you keep her down. Uh, it's kind of a pain to do, though. The blood of sacrifice waters the soil of Erglanfoth. 
His soul split into multitudes, Ravia says with dramatic gusto as he reads the Glanfothan runes from the tablet. Many lives come from one. The truest of power comes from sacrificing a shard to return its strength to the Mother Stone. Hmm, the many lives from one sounds familiar. I was taught that sometimes between death and rebirth, a soul splits perfectly in two, creating two viable souls from one. Sounds strange, but it makes sense when you think about how the population has risen in generations. It's kind of a mathematical necessity that some process like this is happening. Hmm, so why did Wyo lead you to this tablet? Aravia scratches his ear stump and his gaze drags along the floor. If that druid really wanted me to see this tablet, and if Wyo really is guiding my quest for knowledge, there's someone out there who's in the same soul past as me. So what? That's probably true of most of us. I just can't shake the fear that I'm the shard and my destiny is to be fed to something greater. Aravia stares at us, wide-eyed and silent for several moments. Guess worrying won't do me any good. Let's read those other tablets. More than three... We've read this one, right? Oh no. Each generation, Aravius reads from the Glenfothan text, the Anamfoth must stand. Oh, we have read this one. Yeah, we already read this inscription. He remembers. Uh, well, where's the last fucking inscription then? They marked on the map, perhaps? No. Damn it. Was it here? No. We've read this one. Yeah, I know. I know, I know. I just don't see where the last one is. Is it on this? Charred skeletons, the smell is nauseating. Some tablets here, but they don't uh, have inscriptions on them. That we can see. We haven't read them all, have we? What is it about Delamgen that gets my tree trunk bloomin'? My logic tells me they don't have any good poke holes and probably kill you after copulation still. That's repulsive. Agreed, they're easy on the eyes. Yes, indeed, he says, low and slow. I once saw one bathing. I was so startled I forgot I was in my spirit form, I think, so I think my come-hither gestures had a few too many talents to be inviting. I'm probably lucky events transpired as they did. Now I'm getting our best seat and not touch. <laughs> Touched. <sighs> Grieving mother? Nope, still doesn't see her. Can speak another time. Lead the way. Uh, true to form. Where's the last tablet? I hate looking for things. Oh, is this a tablet? No. No. Is it behind this man? No. Why am I wasting the recording's time with this? Oh, there's somebody down here named Naka. The petitioner before us is swaddled in loosely fitting robes. Her hair is greasy and matted. A glossy film of sweat and grime coats her exposed skin. She has the swollen features of pregnancy and several dismissing teeth in her big grinning smile. As we approach, she slowly turns to us and examines us from head to toe, smiling the entire time. Joyous stay to you, she says. Despite coming from a wearied body, her voice sounds resonant and relaxed. I am Naka, midwife and lore keeper. Her hands run across the slight bulge in her belly. She rolls her head back and sighs a relaxed purr. Are you feeling well? Flawless, she replies. Apologies, I should be left to my meditation. The rite of strength is invigorating, almost overwhelming to the senses. She reaches down and cradles her belly in her hands and turns away. I see, you must be involved. Uh... I don't have time for this, okay. But I don't see the, the final fucking fucking thing is we've read them all it's so split into multitudes we've read this inscription already help me out chat what am i missing where am i missing it we've read this one as well yep three seems like a good number uh we talk to somebody maybe can we 
talk to Eva Garrosht. You're welcome, Mr. Moore. Aha, here it is. We did indeed walk past it repeatedly. Essence taken from one by force may, uh... Aravius clears his throat and reads the Glenfothin script on the tablet. Upon Burial Isle, two men meet again for the first time, though it is the last thing they did. The many-colored beast rent them both asunder. They were, in death, merged and made whole again. He looks at us and chuckles nervously. Cute story. Two guys meet in the belly of a soul-eating creature. Maybe someday I'll eat two of the most insipid deer wooden lumberjacks and they'll spend an eternity discussing beer whilst haunting my colon. Perhaps the idea is the Autumn Stelgar might not really destroy souls. That could be true, Eravius mutters, but I guess I don't know what to make of this. I've never, knowingly at least, eaten anyone's soul. Maybe it's a trick I've yet to learn. Lucky me. I mean, if you add what the other tablets were saying about the Stilgar judging the Anamfatha and reuniting lesser souls and such, Eravius folds his arms and looks at us pensively. Okay, the druid was right. I did need to read these tablets. Too bad I'm still confused. Is it safe to say why I brought you where you needed to be? You could most certainly say that, Heravia says with a smile. My tribe was right. The Autumn Stelgar is some sort of soul-destroying beast. But I merely borrow the creature's form, not its reason for being. I doubt I'll change their minds about anything, and it's not like I want to develop a new group of druidic peers amongst these artisans of sacrifice. But what now? Adding it up, I want to head to the Burial Isle. The name was mentioned in the tablets, and it's implied there might be other Autumn Stelgars there. I did not want to hear verification that the Autumn Stelgar was such a terrifying monster, but I am thankful to Wael for bringing me to these tablets. The truth is valuable, especially when it's painful. Do you want a rematch with the Autumn Stelgar? Not exactly. I'm older, wiser, and stronger than when we last tussled, but I um, can't really afford to lose any more eyes or ears. I'm fresh out of redundant organs. I love her, obvious. Good. Adair, how is it you say to Aethasian? How is it you say Aethasian stays so optimistic? The world has not given your time much. It isn't to halt. You get to a certain point and you realize you got two options. You can go mad with grief and tear out all your hair and check yourself into the sanitarium. Or you can wait for better days. But, well, feathers in my case, but I understand your point. Did you hear that? About our awakenings being permanent? If those tell I'm going to write, you and I are stuck with our awakenings. Not quite the news I was hoping for. I'm concerned about you. How are you taking this? Oh, the knowledge that a barely civilized bumpkin will share my mind and body for the rest of my life. That's kind of you to ask. He crosses his arms. I'd actually always believed that Islamir was an ailment that I could cure myself one day, cure myself of one day. But now, to think she'll be around forever. Uh, it's time you dealt with this. You mean now she's stuck with you? She's not that bad. He laughs humorlessly. Overstarched tunics, burnt toast, rawatai sherry. Those are not that bad. But having a stranger pop in and out of your head at will, it's unpleasant, I assure you. And on the bright side, I've got plenty of time to figure out how to deal with her. You've got to make that decision, Eloth. What do you think? Like to like it or not, she's part of you. And she could be a source of strength if you learn to work with her. He's quiet for several seconds. Finally, he nods. It's strange. I've lived with her most of my life, and I've always seen her as an adversary. It should have occurred to me the day she stood up to my father. But there's something about being too close to the situation to see it clearly. He smiles. It will be a relief to stop fighting her. Even as he says it, something struggles within him. The muscles in his face twitch in his skin. His eyes roll back in his skull, exposing slivers of white. Sweat beads and glistens on his forehead. After several seconds, he sighs and looks back at us. That wasn't as difficult as I expected. I think deep down I'd always hoped to find a solution elsewhere. When I was a child, I always thought my mother would come home with a mysterious cure, or that my father, without knowing it, would somehow send her away just as he called her forth. I can't pretend that I didn't spend years of my arcane training hoping one of my instructors would have the answer somewhere in his grimoire. When I joined the Leaden Key, I hoped and believed that with enough loyal service I'd gain the ear of someone in the organization who could help me. Even when I met you and realized your unique talents, I hoped you might be able to reach into my soul the way I've seen you do with so many others. We probably could, given what we've done. I've been looking for someone else to solve my problem, and now I realize I've got to face it on my own. Most people need that kind of guidance. You don't. I've been with you the whole way. I still am. He smiles. That means a great deal to me, truly. 
A cautious, thoughtful look crosses his face. That reminds me something else that Delingan said about the gods not being real. He says it quietly as if afraid someone might overhear him. But Delingan didn't say anything about that. I think I've read about this being a mistake. They did tell us to pray to the gods, so it can't be entirely true. Yes, I suppose so. Still, I can't help but worry about the state we'd be in if it were somehow true. If there were no power guiding us in the life and shepherding us to the next. So don't think about it. I'm sure we'll find a way on our own. Let's just hope it's not the case. Then Islamir would just be a happy accident and you have no one to blame for her. He smirks. Yes, that would take the fun out of it. While we're stopped, let's discuss something else. So, made peace with Islamir? What's that like? Relaxing. More so than I expected, and contentious as she is, I imagined that letting her in would merely unleash the torrent. But now that I'm not fighting her, she seems she isn't fighting me. He sighs, and you were right. I found much to learn from her. How may I be of service? Nice. I'm glad we didn't ditch Aloth, even though we never cast his spells. He's in the sequel as a party NPC. We'll, we'll be with him for a long time yet. Um... So, there is a quest to be done here with some significance to do with the leader of this grove. But I don't know if we have to go meet her. Um, Old Song. Old Song was where we're going to be to meet the, the what's it, right? The Pat postulant. The person who tells us about Redrick's return. Why don't we go ahead and uh, meet the gods? Oh wow, it's just straight into this room, huh? Book of the Hunt, excerpts from the Sermon of Struggle, the Midwife's Memoirs, the Queen that was and still is, and daily affirmations for focus and efficacy. Final Journal of Jonas, that's Gan. Mrs. of the Hand Occult. That's while, while the many faces of Bareth is Bareth. Ten years of dawn as Aethys, selected correspondence as a gift bringer. That's Andra of the sea and forgetfulness. The enigmatic god of cold, Rimmergand. We were going to read that one. Hey, Luinus and Andra Sharn. There's the, the glass path. Shattered and charred stone blocks the passage into sun and shadow. Young students are often confused by Bareth and Remagon's seemingly overlapping roles in holding dominion over death. Bareth oversees the cycle of life, death, and rebirth. Remagon oversees the cold, destructive act of death itself. This difference is often difficult for novices to appreciate until they've lost a loved one and endured an absence for a time. It is Bareth that determines we will be reborn just as certainly as we will die. But Remagon is the executioner's axe. Remagon shows us that all life ends in stillness. And he'd only show them the symbol of Rimmergand, the bone-white Oryx skull found carved within the most ancient of Ingwithin ruins. It is a symbol of death and doom in every culture. Any child with four winters under his belt needs no introduction to the ancient symbol. Rimmergand embodies not just death, but all manifestations of collapse, be they famine, plague, or simple bad luck. Rimmergand is a primal god, silent and inscrutable as death itself. He makes himself known with his passing, not by proclamation. There are innumerable stories of the gods' terrifying passage to the lands of Aeora. When the beasts of winter stirs, bitter winds and beastly howling follow the creature's every move. Wherever the beast plants a hoof, all life withers into dust. The faithful of Rimmergand insist that even another god's life can end in stillness. They claim the other gods must flee from the beast of winter's mastery over death. But we know not if this boast holds true. Though the beast of winter is shrouded in snowy clouds, those who have seen the shaggy white monster claim that the souls of the fallen can be seen clinging, or perhaps frozen to the beast's fur. The dwarves of the boreal south have numerous stories that tell of a similar plot. A brash hero seeks out the beast of winter to rescue the souls trapped in its fur. These tales never end well, for even if the hero saves his beloved soul, the hero dies in the process, for it is not a proper tale of Rimmergand, unless the hero's life ends in stillness. Very well. Sticks. Magnificent. I've seen wild stars in the sky before, but never beneath my feet. A brothel for the ages. Well, we've got 
lots of people to talk to. Why don't we start with... Why don't we save Magran? Oh, it's actually just four. Aerith stands alone. Hilly's alone. Rimagand, Andra, and Scan are together. Forgetfulness and darkness. Abaddon, Magran, and Galloway are together. Interesting, interesting, interesting. Why don't we start with Bareth? Death, life, and the cycle of rebirth are very relevant to the the uh, Hollowborn curse. In the glittering stars of the nearby constellation, we see a grim shape of a skull. Its jaws are open wide as if frozen in a silent scream. Pray to Bareth. We kneel before the shrine and prepare to recite the ritual words. There is life in death, and death in life. There is a rippling shift in the air around us, as if some unfelt wind has changed, bringing unexpected warmth. We feel the peculiar weight of an unseen presence and his eyes upon us. We kneel and pray to Bareth. Even while our eyes are closed, we see a road that seems to stretch on forever. The stars wheel overhead in clockwork rotation of constellations, disappearing over the horizon to our left, only to rise on our right. We try to make out the details on either side of the road, but our eyes can't seem to focus. One moment we think we see a meadow blanketed with mist, and another sheer canyon walls. For just an instant we even see waves lapping over the edges of the road. Were we to step onto the shifting landscape, we feel certain we would only end up back on the road. We know this is a vision, but the packed dirt feels firm beneath our feet, and the night air cool on our face. We are walking. Our feet seem to carry us forward of their own accord. Something looms ahead of us. As we get closer, we see two stone figures that look strangely familiar. Bunin Ianku and Ankui Bunin, two of the oldest representations of Bereth. The two faces of Chirono, what we call Bereth. Shudders slightly, her feathers ruffling as she peers at the figures with apprehension. We remember the door to Cliaban Rudag and the two figures carved into the mountain next to it. One looks vaguely male and the other vaguely female. Only a thin layer of flesh covers their skeletal bodies, which twist to face the doorway between them. The doorway, though, is not what we saw in the ruins. It's a skull, gaping and jawless, and as we look on, its open mouth seems to grow. The arms of the two stone sculptures are swept toward the mouth, inviting us in. Enter the skull's mouth. The road continues through the maw to another shifting landscape surrounded by stars. As we pass through it, we see an identical doorway in the distance. A dwarven man stands near it, unmoving. The usher. We turn and look behind us, only to the skull gate we just passed facing th- just passed facing us. An elven woman waits in the road. Like the dwarf, she stands still. Let's approach the elven woman. We start toward her. There's something unnatural about the way she stands. She's too still. When we get closer, we see that her legs taper into a slender trunk and in place of her feet are gnarled, twisting roots. She lifts her face to an invisible sun. Her long golden hair is the color of autumn leaves, and as we look more closely, we realize that her head is actually covered with tendrils and vines sprouting brilliant yellow leaves, each glimmer with the essence of an entire soul. She gives us a beatific smile. As we look on, the leaves slowly fall from her head and settle to her roots. They melt into the path beneath her, and almost immediately new leaves sprout in the place of the old. She reaches toward us, still smiling as roots spring from her fingertips. Her outstretched arms bar the path. Come, graft your soul to the golden grove. Take her hand. Her roots twine around our fingers, and as they do, they grow rigid and cold. Her outstretched arm petrifies, and as a rough stone bark overtakes our flesh, she can only look on in horror and break away from her brittle grasp. Her feet are rooted in place. She twists and writhes as if trying to flee for her own dying limb. The petrification reaches her shoulder and spreads down her body, freezing it in a painful arc. It creeps up her neck, and she throws her face skyward like a drowning swimmer. The grayness covers her face, freezing her gasp in stone. Now that she is still and lifeless, we can continue past her. Only the golden leaves on her head remain untouched, and as we watch, they fall one by one to the path below. They shrivel as the shimmering essence fades from them. We lift our gaze to see the dwarven man standing further down the road. Approach the dwarven man. We continue down the road toward him. He looks up as we approach, but we can't tell if he's looking at us or through us. His face is smooth but flaccid, as if the flesh detached from the muscles underneath. As we look on, his face begins to change. Wrinkles crack at the corners of his eyes. His mouth sinks, carving deep lines from his nose to the corners of his lips. 
His jowls sag and the loose flesh hangs like dough. He raises his cupped hands. They're covered in blood. He lifts them to his face and smears himself from his newly creased forehead to the waddles of his neck. As he massages the dark, sticky fluid into his skin, the fresh wrinkles disappear. The hanging folds recede, and his flesh tightens as if re-adhering to his skull. He lifts his head, and this time we know he's looking at us. His renewed face looks like a mask, artificially smooth and still. Behind it, his black eyes are two hungry pits, yawning like the empty mouths of skulls. Come, make your sacrifice to the ethic gnoll. His body blocks the path. He extends a bloody hand toward us. Attack him. We strike out and are surprised at, are surprised at how easily his flesh gives beneath our blow. It rips like dried canvas, followed by a long seam that begins at his arm and stretches the length of his body. Blood gushes forth in such quantities that we can't imagine there was anything else in him. Sure enough, the dwarf empties of blood and collapses like a desiccated husk. The blood of the path gleams with a thousand souls worth of essence. The essence evaporates, trailing shining filaments into the night sky. Only now he is dead, can we continue onward? The blood pools around our feet, and a voice echoes along the road, barely more than a whisper on the breeze. We turn them to the wheel. We look up and see the skull gate ahead of us. The candles of Tear Everin wink through the carpet mouth. And the lives of the two figures from Barris' vision. That would be the two druid heads. They've both lived an unnaturally long time, and Barris does not approve. Why don't we next speak to... Um, Hylia. This shrine sits before a bright constellation, the stars forming the oval in the shape of an egg. A pair of wings sprout from the egg, stretching to either side. Wings, wings. It's a weird skull. Pray to her. We step before the shrine and prepare to recite the ritual words. Live every note of life's song. Our words seem to ring in the air. Her voice rendered melodic and lilting by some unseen art. Our eyes shut. As we wait in the darkness, the world around us changes. We feel sunlight bright and warm on our face. A light breeze carries music to our ears. As vivid as these sensations feel, we somehow know they are not real. We look around and find ourselves standing in an open-air temple built on a the summit. It's filled with elves, orlins, and assorted other kith. Ringing the entire scene is a fringe of trees, their verdant branches filled with birds of all different colors, shapes, and sizes. Pelagina takes it all in with squinting eyes and a wry smile. And I'm supposed to feel at home here. Really? Durin spits. A paradise for those who would waste their lives exploring the meaningless while corrupting the meaning of the real world. Oh, to set these trees ablaze, Watcher. Everyone is singularly absorbed in a particular pursuit. An Orlin sits with a yellow canvas, a paintbrush in his hand, and jars of green, blue, and yellow pigments at his feet. An elf and Ramawa standing to the side are locked in conversation, their expressions dancing with delight. Still others scribble standards of poetry or crude sketches on sheaves of paper, losing themselves in the delicate minutiae of lines and syllables. We feel the breeze again, and two elves basking in the sunlight shiver. The largest group gathers in the middle of the temple. They sing a lush, chaotic harmony composed of several complementary melodies. Others drift toward the singers in ones and twos as if buffeted by a gust of wind or a phrase of the song. A ripple passes through the trees. We think it's the wind, but the chirping changes the screeching. Hundreds of birds take to the skies, all headed in one direction, away. Heravius emits a series of chirping bird calls. The flock scrambles into the air. This is bad, he mutters, his face turning sour. Something has them spooked, but they won't tell me what. Then again, I think I mispronounced my bird song and called them incontinent. The devotees glance at the trees, just barely distracted from their activities. The wind picks up, scattering their pages of poetry and art, and ripping the songs from their lips. They look skyward, and we follow their gaze. The dark shape blots out the sun. We can't tell what it is, but as it unfolds and expands, it seems to fill the sky. The wind roars over the summit. That explains the birds. Seldom a good sign. Before we can flee, a shadow falls over the temple. It begins the stain in the corner and spreads, blotting out the flagstones. It reaches the nearest kith, the Blackford Orlin. The darkness swallows her, leaving only a puff of smoke in her place. The two elves that we saw earlier, a man and a woman, flee. We get a brief image of them huddled in the shadow of a mountain. They seem to see us, too, as they reach out, calling silently after us. The others, though, seem frozen. As the shadow advances, they likewise vanish one by one. The driving gale scatters their ashes and the charred remains of their creations. 
You look up again at the source of the shadow, but the eclipsed sun forms a blinding crone around the thing. We can't make out any details. We can, however, feel heat. Restore my temple. We look down and find ourselves standing next to Hylia's shrine in Tyr Evren. Our pulse still races and our skin is damp with sweat from our strange encounter. So that is the dragon. But it's tricky, because the dragon is a winged thing, and so is sacred to Hylia. And also has young, and so is doubly so. Oh, whoops, sorry, I've been muted. Rimmergon, we are praying to. We kneel and close our eyes. As we pray, the blackness fades to white and a howling wind fills our ears. The vision that slowly resolves itself is of a broad, frozen plain. We see a procession of elves in the distance, periodically fading into and emerging from the whiteness. They trudge over snowbanks, their heads down against the driving winds. As they trek past us, one man bundled in furs turns his head. He headed for noon frost and the frost dune breach, too. Before we can answer, he's lumbered ahead. We follow the caravan, and in a couple of minutes, we come to a wall of ice. It disappears into the pale emptiness overhead and stretches as far as we can see in either direction. The elves stop in front of a mirror-smooth section that's framed like a temple door. It seems somehow thinner than the rest of the wall. We can't see what's on the other side, but debilitating coldness emanates from within. The elves pull pickaxes and shovels from their sealskin packs and begin hacking at the smooth ice their implements flying through the air in shining swift arcs. Though they throw their bodies into the labor, not one of them so much as scratches the polished ice. Yet with each blow, something bellows in the distance. Adair calls out to the elves, Hey, I want to hold off on that. But that howling wind seems to swallow up his voice. Halogena's head whips around to see where the bellowing is coming from. Forget about the elves, we need to be ready to move. She turns again to face us, flexing her hands in the cold air. Or fight. The elves hack away, seemingly oblivious to the furious lowing, and to the tremors under your feet. The snow has risen to our knees. We feel like our legs feel frozen in the drifts. Uh, try and get their attention. We grab the nearest elf by her shoulder, shaking her and yelling over the howling winds. We point in the direction of the booming noise, but she only scowls. Leave us, traveler. We've got to get through. We can't stay on this side any longer. Listen, you're angering something very big. You'd better stop. The elf strains to listen. As she rests, her pig in the mounting snow, some of her fellows pause in their labors. A man with a withered, frostbitten finger turns. He raises his maimed hand, and the others stop as well. They stand motionless for several seconds before we realize they've frozen entirely. We touch the elf nearest us, and he crumbles into a mound of snow. A final gale blows past, scattering the remains of the elves in a chaotic flurry. You notice a single spiderweb crack in the smooth barrier. It's the only thing that mars the perfect surface of the ice. Whatever's on the other side of the strange doorway, we feel it tugging at us. Only when we look back and see the parallel gashes trailing behind our legs in the snow do we realize how strong its pull is. A deep whisper carries from the crack. As quiet as it is, it shakes the ground beneath our feet. My end comes to all things in time. 
Seal the frost-hewn breach and instruct the pilgrims in the patience of Remagand. A deep whisper carries from the crack. As quiet as it is, it shakes the ground beneath your feet. My end comes to all things in time. Seal the frost-hewn breach and instruct the pilgrims in the patience of Remagand. I'll give it a handful of snow. We fill our hand with snow and shove it into the crack. It hardens instantly and a hoary rhyme grows over the smooth surface of the frozen doorway, fusing with the rest of the wall. When we take our hand away, the perfect crystal of ice remains in our palm. As we examine the crystal, the vision around us fades, but the unmelting shard of ice remains in our hand. So they want us to deal with the, uh, frosty elves. Can we talk to all of them? Why can't we talk to Remagand or to Scan and Andra? Not that I want to talk to Scan. Oh, no. I only pray to Remagand. Nothing happens when we approach Wudika's shrine. Now that piercing ring fills our ears as we near Wild's shrine. There is no other response. Before the shrine sits the constellation of a snarling hound, fangs bared. We kneel before the shrine and prepare to recite the ritual words. Galloway. Uh, struggle is our fundamental nature. Our words seem to fade once voiced as if they were cast into a vast emptiness. The halls grow deathly still and silent, and then the stars tremble beneath our feet. Did we get it wrong? Oh, we got it wrong. Or, or maybe not. Maybe we're being tested. Alloth! Wow, these guys are fucking tough. Uh, jeez. We're going to die. <laughs> We've lost some of our casters here. Can they survive? Maybe. It's a lot of healing we've thrown out now. Are you casting? Where are you? There we go. Conjuring stunning lightning. Okay. Well, we struggled. As we kneel in front of the shrine, we feel ourselves push forward. We catch ourselves on our hands and knees, feeling damp, warm, damp ground beneath them. Looking around, we find ourselves crouched in a clearing in the middle of the woods. The smell of dirt hangs heavy in the air. We feel certain this is a vision, but the hairs on the nape of our necks still rise. Something leaps from the bushes. We find ourselves pinned on our back and staring into the amber eyes of a massive hound. The beast looks at us. Gleaming fangs protrude from the sides of its mouth. Its nose twitches as it inhales our scent, starting at our shoulder and proceeding down the length of our arm. We follow its nose to our hand, which is covered in blood. The tongue as red and meaty as a steak lolls out of its mouth and swipes our bloody hand. Its lips curl into what looks like a smile. The beast looks back at us as it fixes us with its glowing eyes. Its muzzle retreats into a long, bearded face, and its pointed ears lengthen, dropping to the sides of its head. What was a massive hound becomes a giant man, his broad, muscled shoulders were draped with furs. He holds a flint knife to our neck and grins, revealing a long row of pointed teeth. A row of long pointed teeth. We feel Horavius' tiny but tenacious grip sees our side. Tread carefully. Let my face be a warning sign to always treat Galloway and his messengers with caution and reverence. That's one way to make an introduction, I suppose. His voice is a growling whisper. The lioness reigns still, and soon her cubs will rise. Why did you strike the bear down? 
The lioness had found an advantage and held it. Her cunning made her a more deserving champion. Souls comes will be mightier still one day. The legacy must be preserved, even from a worthy contender. Varnos could not seize his victory. He did not deserve it. He roars. Worthiness is proven in conflict. Might grappling with might. Flesh tear tears, bones break. And the ones that mend are stronger still. Blood mixes and the worthier substances rise to the top. The changeling throws his head back and closes his eyes, breathing deeply of the cool air. And you have proven worthy. He lets out a howl that rings through the air. He lowers his head, puffs of steam rising from his panting mouth. Twigs crunch and branches snap. The ground shivers under your weight, under the weight of pacing, prowling footsteps. A dozen beasts, bears, wolves, and long-fanged cats stalk out of the underground, their matching amber eyes fast on us. Your obvious is paces about, sizing up the pack and circling the party as he emits a Stelgar's growl. Such pow powerful specimens, larger than anything I've seen in the deepest forests of Erglanfoth. The father of monsters is deserving of his name. Some of them look real soft. I bet I could tame one or two. Is this how you would threaten us, Galloway? With cats and dogs? Aloth takes a step back from the beasts. Just how real do you think this is? As the beasts encircle us, their master rises to his feet. Even the largest of the bears can only reach his browned and muscle-knotted shoulders. We stand, mindful of the ring of predators surrounding us. You sought and won the favor of Galloway. What new prey do you now pursue? I hunt Theos. Galloway, the changeling, bears his sharpened teeth again. To track a quarry, you must understand its movements. And Theos now follows, follows the path of a more powerful master. A warm breeze carries the smell of smoke and gunpowder. Sparks ignite and float in the draft, catching in leaves over Galloway's head. A sudden blast of heat scalds our face. And even as we turn away, a flash of light sears our vision through our eyelids. When we look back, we see a woman in full plate standing next to Galloway. Her mirror-polished armor flickers with images of reflected flames. We can't see her face, but her voice is strong and clear like the ringing of steel. Let him know his foe, says Magrin. The whore breaks her silence at last. Have you missed me, Magrin? You may have found other lovers, but surely none was my equal. Magrin says nothing in response. Indeed, she never even glances in Durance's direction. An involuntary tick causes the baggy skin beneath Durance's eyes to quiver. He says no more, his ruddy skin blanched white. Theos has trapped thousands of souls in sun and shadow like rabbits in a snare. Now he goes there to retrieve the kill for his master, Wittica. One of the bears paws at the ground in irritation, its hackles rising. The god closes his eyes and inhales deeply. She will feast on them, suck their marrow, grow strong on their essence. As the Stelgar watches us, it licks its lips its tongue scraping long fangs. Why would Theos help Woodiga? Because he is her hound. He has always done her bidding. His eyes dart to another figure standing just behind Magrin. Her helm pivots sharply toward him. Woodiga stands for an old order. So does Theos. A golem made of blackened, pitted iron earth iron steps out of Magrin's shadow. Its movements are slow yet precise, each footfall accompanied by the groaning and grinding of metal. The steady orange glow of furnace coals emanates from its eye sockets. The gear clicks within its jaw and Abaddon speaks. They both fear change, and the deerwood has changed much recently. People find answers not in the gods, but in animancy, the product of their own labors. Reflected flames shiver in Magrin's armor. And why not, when they have learned that even a god can be killed? Durance's eyes are wide. His beard is matted with sweat. Was that not as you commanded, my lady? We sought only to stoke your pride by bringing your vision to reality. Magrin stands still, unwavering. It is as though she had not heard him at all. She says that like it was she says that like it wasn't her followers that unleashed the god hammer. Animancy doesn't seem to trouble you. The three gods seem to look at one another. One of the wolves sits and scratches its neck with a quick stroke of its hind leg. Galloway and shrugs his broad soldiers so shoulders, the clash of ideas, the search for answers and meaning. These are other hunts. They would supplant you. How can you accept this so easily? Magrin's pauldrons shift as she clasps her hands behind her back. This is the destiny of Kith, to struggle and transform, even through animancy, and to improve. Abaddon's voice creaks and sighs. Steady labor and earnest industry elevate Kith above wilder and beast. The scarred Stelgar growls and flicks its tail. 
It is also useful that they should learn to improve their souls, whether through struggle, transformation, or labor. On this, at least, we have no disagreement. If only the God's followers were as open-minded about the Animancy as you three. You haven't done anything to stop Theos. There is a pact. One Woodica herself is just barely kept. We gods must allow, more, allow mortals to direct their own affairs. This limit keeps peace between us. So Woodica directs Theos, and he does her will. Pelagina sneers with contempt. Weaving through loopholes in a divine contract, I'm not surprised to hear that the gods are just as unethical as mortals when it suits them. Durance grunts. And these gods do the same with us? Haloth smirks. And now these three direct us. One wolf nips at another, and its fellow growls back. It is not our fight. What should I do about it? Track Theos. Follow the trail he has left for you, and corner him in sun and shadow. You must stop him before he empowers Woodica. Here's whir and clank as Abaddon gives us a slow nod. And if you do, you will have a different decision to make. Alagina narrows her eyes. Experience with superior officers tells me this decision has a right and wrong answer as far as the lot of you are concerned. Alice's eyes widen. The gods mean to leave this in our hands. And if you believe you are free to make that decision how you wish it, you have not been listening to our conversations along the road. Heravius tugs at our clothes, leaning in for a close whisper. I have a really bad feeling about this decision being a trap. I mean, how often do the gods really leave the decisions up to mortals like us? Souls were ripped from the world, ripe and full and pulsing with essence, one of the wolves slavers, baring its teeth in a wide grin. Scatter them like bones to a pack of dogs. Their essence will strengthen the souls of the deerwood. Let the remains of the dead feed the survivors. Why would I feed the lost souls' essences to the rest of the deerwood? To breed strength. Power is born from the mixing of essence and blood. The wolves snarl and snap. What Theos did cannot be undone. Thousands of lives have changed, and thousands more ended because of his actions. A plume of flame ripples across her breastplate. The transformation gives purpose to trial. And improvement is the goal of all kith. Long lives, prosperous futures, stronger minds and bodies. Strengthening those who remain will help repair the damage that Theos has done to the Deerwood. If Wudica can accomplish this, then perhaps she deserves her victory. You make a sound point. If she is victorious, then she will prove herself most capable and most devious of the gods. Heravius cast his gaze away from the clever hound as his voice drops to a strained whisper. Calloway teaches that one ought to celebrate the fittest in any struggle. What good could possibly come of Wudica's plan succeeding? The bear at Galloway's side raises on its hind legs and roars. It falls back on all fours with a ground-shaking thud. Galloway points his chipped flint dagger at you. A victory that leaves her ruler of all. No room for conflict, no struggle, not even between the gods. Be careful what you wish for, mortal. Wudica's ways are regressive. Her laws never change, her authority never ebbs, and she never forgives a slight. Wudica would crush the deerwood simply out of vengeance for the rebellion against a deer her favored. She would stamp out animancers, godslayers from the saints' war, and anyone else she viewed as heretical or dangerous. It would be justice for the purges to see some of the persecutors face her wrath, and not the right kind of justice, not the kind that heals. Given the previous attempts on our lives by the leaden key, we shall assume that includes us. And who more dangerous to her than a watcher who prods at her schemes? I don't see why I should care, because your soul will be at her mercy, and already you know too much. Wudica will not keep the pact. She will interfere with mortals the very way we have always avoided. Her development will no longer be in your own hands. Stagnation, as Stelgar roars, will be caged and stunted. Now I've got to find Theos. Magrin steps closer, her brilliant armor ringing with each movement. And when you descend the pit to sun and shadow, you can count on our assistance when you reach safe, safely, when you s to see you safely through. And I hope we can count on yours when you reach the bottom. There are many souls upon the burial isle that are sworn to serve us. They belong to you now, and they shall guide your descent. Durance's face is grave. Beware the promises of a god-watcher. They are binding, but only in one direction. Pelagina snorts and advances toward Magrin. I've danced to these tunes before. You'll count on us to deal with whatever's down there, and we can count on you to take credit for it later. The beast grows restless, pawing at the ground and eyeing us with renewed interest. The bear sniffs to the ground next to our leg. One Stilgar skulks in a circle, its amber eyes glowing. Galloway hurls his knife between our feet, sinking to its handle. He raises his empty hand. Hunt him, mortal. And when you stop him, let the souls he has captured feed the deerwood. 
Strengthen the souls of those who remain. Prepare them to face the challenges that will follow. Pledge that you will do this, and we will grant you a power fit for the finest warrior who ever lived. Betray us, and my beasts shall track you down. Our allegiance is not to be accepted and cast aside. Aravius nods up and down, following Galloway's every word. As the seeker god finishes his commandment, Aravius turns pale. My friend, this is a most auspicious moment. The Lord of the Hunt has spoken to us without omission or riddles. Heed what he has said about beasts seeking us out, should we just stray from, just stray from the task. It is not an empty promise. So if you promise to do this to the gods and then violate that oath, then in the second game you are cursed. Something bad happens to you for betraying the gods. Now, of course, I resisted this temptation uh, in the past because they do give you a boon for the, in the short term. It might be funny, though, to piss off all the gods. I mean, they are assholes. I'm not a fan. Oh, reading about them, they're all survivable. Uh, Galloway's might be the hardest, actually, if you violate his oath, but I'm, I would hear what the other gods have to say first. Consider and calculate, but decide. Galloway's hand falls and the growling pack lunges into the circle. The vision vanishes in an instant, returning us to Tyr Evren, where burning candles replace the glowing eyes of Galloway's beasts. Talk to Durance about Wittica. Does what we just learned about Wudika trouble you? It stinks of her. It is justice, but if her great purpose was, his face contorts in fury, to think Magrin would fall prey to such deceit. And Aethus, Widewin has always claimed to be invading Deerwood to free it. What if it were true? What if he came to stop Wudika's plot before it began? Surely Aethus earned his death at Godhammer Citadel, but not for those reasons. Not to keep him silent. If such a thing has brought about this chaos, Durance tilts his head as if listening to an inner voice, and he frowns, his frown deepening as he speaks. Durance's face collapses in fury, his body shaking. Must we always be tools of the gods? If Wudica and Magran, if they are the cause for this, the Hollowborn, if the purges were never necessary, if Aethus was fighting back? And your god hammer didn't save Deerwood. It doomed it. Aethus needed to be stopped. So does Wudica. Durin stiffens, and he takes a long, slow breath, steadying himself. I know, Durin seems to sag for a moment. It had to be done. Would it have been better had you been spared this knowledge? No, Durin is cold. It... I am glad to have walked this far with you, seen this truth. Perhaps it is what I was meant to see. He glances at us beneath his brows warily, with a watcher's eyes. All these dances of words and intrigues, machines of men, twisted, ripping the souls of children, and by the gods, the goddess of justice. And by the gods, the goddess of justice. If I could end her like Aethus, I... He takes a breath, his eyes narrowing. Magran burned her once. One can do so again. Her face darkens. Wudika. She must answer to her own justice. Justice or revenge. Anyone with any shred of spirit seeks both justice and punishment. It burns in the heart of anyone who lives, Durrance frowns, his hands clenching. All seek it. If the world does not balance, we'd all drown in the oceans, and the gods would not care. Magran, she must be redeemed, and punishing Wudika, that will serve. Do we know that Magran was not a willing accomplice? Magran was allied with Wudika. She tried to kill all the makers of the Godhammer. Durrance looks at us for a moment. Then his lips peel back, sneering. Is this some final joke at my expense? To test my faith further? He laughs loud and harsh. And why would you think that, Watcher? Because she didn't want anyone to know that the Godhammer had been made. No one knows how it came how the Godhammer had been made, and no one knows how it came to be except a few among Magran, like yourself. Durance frowns, and his smile dies as he stares at us. If all you have are questions, then I have enough of those. She is a bitch of a goddess, to be sure, but even a whore only goes so far in crossing those she serves. You say you left Ashfall without telling anyone of your departure. Durance is silent for a moment. When he speaks again, he speaks low and slowly, almost carefully. You answer a question with a question, he frowns. Then why did I feel her disappointment at Halgut? Why were we shamed? Because I think she tried to kill you there. Durance looks at us for a moment as if we're mad, then his lips peer back, peel back, sneering. 
kill me. He laughs loud and harsh. She is a goddess. I still drink from her burning breasts, watch her. His face burns and his hand clenches tight on the staff. If she wished me dead, she could trace me to my source and kill me. In the dream of the god hammer, your spirit looked blurred and distinct in the light, as if it had been sheared from you. Durant stares at us, his expression frozen. But he's silent, listening. If you've been damaged, as I saw in the god hammer vision, then she may be unable to see you as you once were. Durant turns from us for a moment. His face twists in thought, conflicting emotions running across his features. Finally, he turns to us, his face steady. There's no proof, Watcher. I was a fool to think you could help me see any farther than I could. If you don't trust me, then trust the staff. Admit that the other Godhammer builders are dead. Durrance turns to the staff, and for a moment we see his eyes burning, taking in the edges of the wood, the symbols inlaid there, the eleven faded circles. They died in the blast, yes, the other eleven. I was the only one to walk away. I thought we had wronged our goddess, that this was my trial, and if I could prove myself worthy, worthy of her, I should have known better. There is only one god of redemption, and I saw him ended. He studies the staff, and we feel a wave of heat, a terrible energy rolling forth from it in waves. So much so it feels as if the god hammer itself is alive in his hands, and past it we hear a cry like a child being born, and our eyes feel the flash of white, and a hundred imagined shades of purple and white, streaming and circling into the howling of the storm, and beneath it the grinding of ancient machines of stone, rock, and metal, grinding and turning until all around us feels as if it's burning, sinking into the shadows of the earth, beneath the ground, the only place where a spirit might find refuge. When our vision clears, we see Durrance, his hands clutching the staff and his eyes bright, burning red. Atop the staff, the flame burns cleanly, brightly. As his gaze burns, he rips his gaze away from it and howls, a bellowing, a horrid howl like a wounded animal, and sweat pours down his brow. We can see that justice is served, to her and Woodica both. To think, I served her. I followed her, Durrance's face cracks into a snarl. Now I shall serve no one. Woodica's lies must be answered. And now it seems I must take fire and war from a goddess's false claim as well. His face becomes stone, his eyes still burning, almost hungrily. I still take from her strength as I did, for as long as it lasts, Durrance snarls. For I shall not cast her aside yet until I have drained her dry and had my fill, just as she intended for me. For I have learned one of the lessons of the faithful. The faithful may wound a goddess greater than any enemy. A purification is coming, and this fire shall consume them both. Fusion of history? No. Something else. Bagrin? Swelling up with questions. We did it. I think we finished this quest. The Trials of Durance. Quest complete. We made it. One triptych remains. Uh, oh no, we already did this. We did Brimagant. We did Bareth. We did Helia. We did this last guy's. Everything's all set. Do you still have family living in the Deerwood Adair? No, not these days. Parents left the country years back during the purges. I think about them a lot. It's a shame that you and your family suffered even after the Saints' War ended. You dear wouldn't certainly have a knack for holding on to old grudges. Oh! Stop right there. Ghost elves! The phantom soldier raises his short sword to our chest. You're in the wrong city, Inquisitor. Did you think you wouldn't be recognized here in your old home? I've seen your trials with my own eyes. I've seen you light pyres with good people tied to them. People I'd known many a year. He seizes us by the throat and our airway tightens, whether real or imagined we cannot tell. They deserve your confession. He raises the point of his sword, holding it a hair's breadth from our eye. Suros, what are you doing? Startled, the soldier releases us immediately and turns to face the speaker, a woman in a plain wool tunic, fully a head shorter than he, but somehow seeming to tower over him. We've seen this woman's face before, but from afar, bloodied and burned as she lay stretched across an iron wheel. At the moment, it is marked only with concern. An assassin sent by the Inquisition, my lady, daring to approach our camp. If he is so poor an assassin as to approach an armed guard in daylight, 
I should have nothing to fear. I would hear what this man has to say. She stares him down until he can no longer face her. He turns away, sour-faced, watching us through sidelong glances, his knuckles white around the pommel of his sword. Guevara's eyes widen as she sees our face for the first time. My own brother returned home. I never dreamed this day would come. Grand Inquisitor Theosix Arcanon dispatched me here to spy on you. She doesn't blink. Are things as desperate as that over there? I'd never have known. I hope your next assignment is more stimulating. Listening to my lectures is dull work for a spy. But there are a few things stronger than the bonds of family. I should never have doubted we'd be reunited one day. Whatever your reasons, I've missed you over all these years. Having you here now at a time when I'm surrounded by strangers is a wonderful gift. I would like for you to stay here in our camp as my guest. No longer able to remain quiet, the soldier approaches Yovara and puts his hand on her shoulder, turning her aside. His voice is hushed, but by no means private. My lady Yovara, I beg you, this is an inquisitor. This is a desperate attempt on your life. The only way it can succeed is if you allow it to. She brushes his hand away with the calm grace of the resolute. This is a missionary, same as I was. Taught the wrong things, as I was. If I can't find faith in one man's ability to reason once he knows the truth, what hope do we have? My lady, he admits being a spy. That should make him less of a threat, wouldn't you agree? I have nothing to hide. All I see here is an opportunity to persuade someone who could help us. We have many former missionaries here. They are our most loyal, our most helpful. Many have died for us. These are not people we should be turning away. And if the Inquisition wants my life, they can have it. But they know as well as I do that my cause will not die with me. Yvara beckons us somewhere behind her. Come. We have much to discuss. Yovara leading a campaign against the gods. In a time when the gods were new, let's feed this guy that poison potion. Simok. Simok crosses his arms over his scarred chest. Something else? Here's the potion you asked for. Something's wrong. This is the essence potion you asked for. Send for Ruta if you doubt it. He reaches out with his hand, gnarled by age in battle. He clutches the vial close to one faded blue eye. To my tribe's salvation. He drains the vial in one long gulp, swallows, and after sputtering for several seconds, he glares at us. His breath sounds ragged and wet. She poisoned me. He begins to raise his hand to the warriors in the room. You just swallowed a mixture of concentrated essence and blood. How did you expect that to feel? I suppose you're right. He takes a couple of slow, deep breaths. And I suppose I should thank you for your service. Thank you, Estramore. Lyris looks us in the eyes and gives us a slow nod. Virtue guides your hand, Karet. That was a huge amount of experience for that. For that nothing that we did there. Right, fetch and feather slas. Repeat, please, in a deer, and stand closer so I can grab your neck when you said what I think you did. That was Izlmir. She likes your feathers. Thanks, but I'm not interested, Izlmir. It was Izlmir, I promise. I swear an oath. Uh, so they want us to kill the druid king here. Can't camp here? But I want to camp here. I want to take a little nap. A little snooze. Why don't we... Okay, what do we have to do? First off, let's go to Old Song. And uh, let's see if we can get hold of this quest. Galloway's Maw. Hearthsong District, Burial Isle, Lunefrost. Where's this quest to, to deal with Big Bad Man? Is it not here? What if we go back and talk to Chad Nua? In theory, talking to the steward, I have some questions. Uh, was this your keep once? Not as a land as its lord, more as a child who is its mother's. This castle was my design, you see. The Earl appointed me to do it. I was getting on in years. I knew this would be my only chance to build something magnificent. When it was built, I couldn't bring myself to part from it, to go back to my lonely home. I begged the Earl to let me stay, to take care of it. 
was all I wanted, and he granted it. Years later, when Barris Usher finally came calling, I begged the Earl to find a way to let me remain. So he did. Are you imprisoned in that throne? Imprisoned? At times it feels that way, I suppose, but it's more that I reside here. The throne was brought up from the ruins, one of the first things they found. As a last favor to a dying woman, when the Earl arranged for me to be moved into it, Adra is an accommodating vessel for a soul. Oh, it's not as confining as it seems. I can feel the whole keep from here. All the things that are tied to it. There's something about this throne and its construction, or maybe something about this place. Imprisoned. No more questions with the state of the keep. Ah, where to begin? You're supposed to have a job for me, ma'am. I can't. I, it's important that we deal with Mr. Mr. Dead Doomsday. It's, it's important. I had some questions about Consul Hout and the Torn Bannerman. Who is Consul Hout the Mage? A famed Archmage. I'm given to understand that the Brackenberry Sanitarium puts much stock in his work as regards the manipulation of the soul. His spells are widely circulated, but he is poorly regarded in many circles. Many call him a madman or else cruel and barbarous. He must be very old by now. But the Torn Bannerman. We've heard these lines before. Uh, hmm, so where am I supposed to get this job? for an inn in this area. Uh, it's not marked on the map anywhere. Glenfathen Home, Glenfathen Home. Hearthsong Market. Where the fuck is this inn? None of these buildings look like inns to me. Oh, there it is. Celestial Sampling. It is marked on the map. Dong, the Grieving Mother. Oh, we swapped out the Grieving Mother as well, by the way, as you can see. Oh, she's naked. Whoops. Mind Plague. Amplified Wave. Let me give her disintegration as well. Doot. Put some clothes on, ma'am. Oh, did we ever give him the second chance armor? Survivor. I just plus some survival. Jack of Wide Waters. Um, Rotuk, who's this? You want up? I pull. You. Frightened villager. The man looks up sharply as we approach, eyes going wide. You! You're the one, the one he's looking for. He sets down his wine. You killed Lord Radric. What if I did? No, you don't understand. It didn't work. It. I'm one of the guards of the keep. Was one of the guards. He's killed most of them, the ones you didn't. Cole, she didn't last very long. Nothing but empty air, him. Nice enough to work for, I mean. Much nicer. But that didn't help him when Redrick came back. God's the screaming. His eyes. It was like he was burning inside. He shudders. He says he's come back to lead us like before. That he's going to kill you for what you've done. I told him I'd find you, give you a challenge. His challenge. Do it all honorable, that sort of thing. He let me go. And I kept on running far as my coin let me, he laughs bleakly. Funny me running into you anyhow. Then perhaps I should seek him out. You mean I have a chance to kill him again? How could I refuse? It won't be like last time, I think. He's not human, I mean not mortal anymore. It's like he's just up and refused to stay dead. Up and refused to stay dead. I've never seen anything like it. Hopefully i never see anything like it again. In fact, I'm staying put here and drinking until I don't remember a thing. I wish you all the luck in the world, friend. There's something awful in that keep. Howling after your blood. Let me take a nap. Welcome, welcome. Who are you? 
My name is Eletharian. They call me the Haggard Shoes for all the walking I used to do and all the boots I wore down. But those days are well behind me. My eyes have seen a great deal, and now my ears get their fill from travelers who come through here. Tell me about this place. Of course, I founded this inn many years ago, but in many ways its tale begins much earlier. It was while I was returning from a long journey south that I first heard the story of the tree upon which this inn rests. Hundreds of years ago, a strange event occurred. The sky was troubled that night, with many stars falling toward this across the sky. One of those same stars began to plummet instead towards Aora, and fell here, striking a young tree and burying itself within like a fiery heart. But the tree survived, and over the years it grew and grew and grew, twice as big as its fellows in half the time, till it reached the size you see now and grew no more. Hearing the tale, I knew I must find the truth. And you see it here, he gestures toward the large stone at the center of the room. Around the tree's heart I built this inn, to welcome all travelers who might look upon it. I am always glad to see a new face. Take a seat where you like, my friend. It seems to me you've walked a long road. All are welcome here, and those with interesting stories most of all. What have you got for sale? Spirit spiral, plus 5% melee damage, and more whispers of treason? Well, we can't say no to that, can we? Although, I think he's already got racers, probably. You're obvious, you can have some whispers of treason. They know the Duke's own beef loaf. Beef loaf is a standard dish in the deer wood. Um, plus two might, plus two constitution, plus two resolve. Well, that's a pretty fucking good buff. Odena Firgus, the hero of the Saints' War. We got a visitor. Ishquinan. Anissia Silversmith, those are our backer NPCs. Hi, monk. The monk massages his temples, his face buried in his palm. As he approaches, he looks as we approach, he looks up. This room needs a proper door, he mutters. My brothers and I rented this space that we might have some measure of privacy in this foreign land. Perhaps you could find another room here at the inn. What brings you order to this place? We travel where the teachings take us, the monk mutters, his voice slow and measured, not that it is any of your business. Who are you? He briefly opens his mouth to answers, then swallows his words. He looks us up and down, carefully choosing his response. My brothers and I were having a private discussion in a room we rented for our use. Please, there is a tavern full of people who would provide us with the pride of the banter you seek. Have a moment. I would like a word with you. Hmm. Gwyneth. A slender woman with dusty leathers locks eyes with us. It's good to see someone from more civilized lands around here. Her unkempt hair sprouts in wavy black tufts. Despite her fine features that sculpt her face, a cleft chin completes her boyish appearance. I'm learning firsthand the many shortcomings of Glanfathen and hospitality. Her gloved hands come to rest on the pommel of a long estuk, cinched low at her hip. I can almost forgive the hostility toward outsiders, but the temperate taverns and these watered-down drinks. Inexcusable. I hope it don't seem too forward, but I've heard of you. A sly smile carves a dimple on her cheek. You're famed among the dozens, and that makes us allies. She gives us a coquettish sideways glance. And allies, well, they help each other, do they not? What help do you need? My friends have drawn some unwanted attention. Gwyneth looks to both sides, scanning for uninvited listeners, Glenfothan scouts, and not just any mob of zealots, the Fangs. She pauses to let the name settle in the air. The Fangs were a brutal, relentless bunch, eager to make an example of troublesome outsiders. As for why I need your help, she smile widens as she speaks. I need someone to warn the expedition that trouble is coming, and I need someone ready to fight if it comes to that. With any luck, we'll reach my friends before the Fangs do. But if not, Fangs have a reputation to uphold, so this might require the spilling of blood. Why aren't you with your Fang? What did your friends do to draw their attention? Just setting foot in Erglanfath is a good way to offend the tribes. I don't know how they picked up our trail. I suspect one of our newer scouts didn't cover his tracks well enough. When I spotted the fangs, they were retracing the path of the expedition it had taken days before. Aren't you with them? It was my turn to handle far patrol. I spotted the fangs on my trek back to the camp. I knew that rejoining the main group would risk leading the enemy right back to the expedition. I knew the woods, and I knew how to stay quiet. But I don't know how to stake my friends' lives on the ability to sneak past expert hunters like the fangs. They noticed me warning my friends we'd have been overrun. Gwyneth tilts her head to the side and points at us with a grin. But if they notice me and some reinforcements, like, say, you, well, at least we can scare them off and put up a good fight. Tell me more about the expedition. 
I like to think it's a mission of reclamation, she darts a shrewd smile. It's said that our army has left behind many valuables in their hasty retreat from Erglanfoth at the end of the War of Black Trees. So the way I see it, we're simply gathering up what our ancestors left behind. I doubt the Grunfothans agree with me on this, she adds with a dimpled grin. My expedition set out from Defiance Bay, heading directly at east into Kogoros and the Glenfathen lands. I split off once we arrived at the Bale, the natural frontier between our nations. The plan was for me to keep an eye on the Glenfathens while the main group scoured the target area. For days we eluded them. She walks her fingers over the black of her leather glove, leaving a trail on its dusty surface. But the fangs got wise to our presence. Your friends are trespassing. By local custom, they're criminals. She frowns and blinks several times. You'll forgive me if I'm not sympathetic with face painters and their barbaric laws. I'm not pretending that what we're doing is noble. I just don't believe trespassing is a crime that warrants execution. I'll help you warn him. She smiles an overt display of dimples. Excellent. I knew I could count on you. She leans in and whispers. Assuming the fangs didn't already get them, my friends should now be at or around the Pilgrim's Trail in Northweald. The plan was to camp along a trail leading to the Temple of Helia. Find my comrades. Warn them the fangs are coming. And help them clear out the forest. I'll head out first on my own to see if I can't lead the fangs astray and buy us some time. She pulls a rest like a few inches out of its scabbard and cracks a smile. If the gods smile on us, we won't have to draw steel. Should it come to that, I'm glad you're at our side. Sure. Oh, there's somebody outside. Renato, she'll pay. That witch, she'll... Fuming with anger and pacing in tiny circles, the Valian merchant aims his wild rats as we approach. You there! Have you come to trade with these savages? Learn from my example and take your business elsewhere. Spittle accents is every sentence. Liars, cheats, swindlers. That duplicitous beach alari. She claimed to be selling a large gold of flower buds. But all I have now is six bushes of common house plants. The herbs are useless. He throws a handful of dried plants to the ground, stomping on the brittle stems and leaves, kicking up punch and savory scents. I'll get my money back from that swindling savage. What did Alari say when you confronted her? Nothing of substance, he quickly mutters. She defended herself, of course, saying the herbs were legitimate. Why wouldn't she lie? No one would value my word over hers. He spits on the ground. Alari can lie with impunity when surrounded by her gangs of savage thugs. What do you intend to do about this? When I get my hands on... He halts his sentence, his eyes darting to the nearby Glanfathen guards. I'm in the savage's home court, so it's my word against hers. Where does that leave me? I'd be a fool to threaten her here on tribal soil. He sighs and presses his temples. I cannot sell this worthless herb to recover my coin, and I am powerless to confront Alarhi. I don't suppose, if you were willing to mediate, perhaps you could succeed where I failed. I would, of course, pay you handsomely. I will see what I can do. What have you got for sale? He looks away from us, scratching his neck and shifting his feet. I am destitute and have but a few meager offerings left to sell. How dreadfully embarrassing. If I can recover my investment from Alarhi, I'll have funds to resupply my stores. Until then, you're welcome to have a look at what I have in stock. St. Jiren's Horn! It's real! Thy, thy clef. Thy clef. But that's much better. Much better than the, which would make sense because we haven't changed this since we were in our very first area of the game. <laughs> Where is this lady? Is she at the Hearthsong Market, perhaps? Um, Ewan, Ron, and Derwin. Hard bargain. Oh, addendum added. Talk to Alahi. Yeah. Something to feed your stomach? Tell me about your trade. Ah, my life is simple and makes a poor tale. I tend the gardens in my herd and my family picks this delicious fruit you see behind me, the gods of inkind. No taste testing. Derwin. Ah, I see that you heard it. A good blade has a voice and it sings to its wielder. What weapon calls you forward? Tell me about your craft. My weapons speak for themselves. I bear the knowledge my father had and his mother before him. Take up one of my blades, and you hold a weapon five generations in the making. They say I should not waste such fine weapons on Estramore, and I say a good weapon lying on the rack is the true waste. Let me see your wares. What have you got? Star collar. Attacks can stun on crits. So oh, minor missiles once per encounter. Uh, 
strike hard. Bleska's labor. Superb quality. Oh, and it's draining as well. Is he already using a superb weapon? Oh, that's pretty good. How does it rank up against uh, this? Also superb, but better in general. Uh, wrong person. Derwin. Let me see your wares, Derwin. Yeah, why don't we get him Leshka's labor? Crit had Pames. Only fine. Resolve plus three. That's pretty cool. This is exceptional and grants regeneration. That's pretty good. And plus, yeah, plus one endurance per three seconds. That's not, that's not much. Um, but what kind of armor is he wearing right now? I'm not going to turn down an exceptional helmet of Dark Sea. <laughs> dark Sea. You know? Sea Dark. What kind of armor are you wearing? Oh, it's a second chance one. It'd be great if we could make this exceptional. Oh, exceptional is not that great. Superb is the great one. Um, but we can still make it exceptional. Whoosh. Done. And let's give this to, or is he also using a second chance armor? No, he's using an intellect armor. Yeah, he's not really heavily armored right now. We should probably give him heavily armored armor. Heavily armored armor for him. Do do. Give you the uh, brains robe. Actually, why don't we give it to our protagonist who has not ever had anything uh, armor wise? Oh, that's no, 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 not that. No, keep him in clothes. Keep him in clothes. He needs to be fast. He hasn't been dying. Um, well, I guess we'll just have this for nothing then. Whatever. It's fine. Who are we talking to? Welcome, Esther Moore, she says with a curtsy. I'm looking for Alahi. She's not here. So I'm running the shop while she's away. You're looking for herbs, tinctures, etc. Welcome back, Esther Moore. How can I help? These big heels. Plus 100 endurance. They're expensive, but major recovery uh, reduces hostile effects. Major regeneration. 32 endurance or 15 seconds. Why don't we buy the major endurances? Hand him over. I think we're going to need him to have some of those in the fullness of time. Whoa, whoops. Didn't mean to do that. Potion of power. Plus 25% attack speed for a while. Um, I think reload speed and attack speed are different, so. You win. Looking for Alarhi. Where might I find her? She lives not far from here. The little girl points with exit out of the market. Climb up the stairs. At the top, there's a circle of ruins. Do you know it? It's the north side of Hearthsong. Anyway, your house is right there. The door faces those ruins. Run it. May I see your wares? Uchane. Oh, it's expensive. Damn. That's some costly pistols. Rending Annihilation. This is, uh... Yeah. Ergy's Radiance. Here, let's see. Let's use the sell price trick. May I see your wares? Oh, yeah. Sells for more. Sheathed in autumn. There it is. This is a superb quality weapon. But it's just kind of a normal thingus. We'll hold on to the Blade of the Endless Paths just because it's mythic. Oh yeah, who needs this plus two dex? Oh, he's not wearing a shirt now. Put that on. Yep, those are both second chanced. Very good. Resolve plus two. Do you sell... Whoa, what just happened? There we go. Everything went all wrong resolution. 
so hard to keep your gear up to date. So hard to know when it's time to swamp. I wonder if any of the shops in uh, Defiance Bay will have updated themselves. She's in the house that faces the ruin on the north side of town. Uh, that could be like any of these. Is it this one? Alahi, there she is. She is surrounded by force. An old elven woman stands tall and proud, surrounded by Glenfathen warriors that study our every move. You speak on Renato's behalf, I presume? I knew you would convince someone to do his bidding. I did not suspect it would be the Estramore involved in all the chaos at Defiance Bay. She tilts her head to the side and blinks slowly. Does the presence of my armed entourage concern you? You were expecting a defenseless shopkeeper, am I right? She raises her dye-stained hand just as one of her attendants begins to lurch forward. Stillness, she barks. Give the Estramore a chance to speak. There are not dear wooden beasts here. Here, hospitality reigns. Alari nods to us, holding up an open hand, her palms and fingers covered in green and blue dye. Envoy of the Valians, speak the message you were sent to deliver. I want to hear your side of the story. The first step of any sensible path. Renato did purchase for me several bushes of Alard Gola, and for it he paid a high price but did so willingly, saying it was a bargain right as he handed me his copper. It was after our trade that the Valians spit his venom. Renato accused me of trickery, fraud, claiming I delivered withered likenesses of Eliard Gola and not the genuine root. Such nerve, for in truth he is beyond the help of Eliard Gola. She smiles. Renato's old brow bow was infirm enough for a full draw. No amount of Eliard Gola would give him the spear of a young hunter. A fair deal was made, and now Renato objects, angry that his family plow is beyond herbal remedies. I have never sold anyone a remedy I knew to be false. If Renato does not silence his slanderous tongue, I will do it for him. Um, what kind of punishment did you have in mind? Renato has slandered his host, making him no longer a guest. The merchant must vanish from Twin Elms. The Glenfoth and hospitality must be observed. He is to be given a chance to leave on his feet before he bleeds on his back. Deliver in our name a warning. Tell Renato that if he does not leave, he will be accused of conspiring to pilfering within relics from our lands. He won't risk a trial by the council of Amanfatha. Anamfatha. Alarhi draws a small wooden cage from the folds of her robe. If you won't listen, tell him this faulty member will end in a cage, just like this black beetle. Food for our birds. The reputation of your tribe is tied to your actions. Is this how you want future trading partners to remember your kin? The Glanfathans look at each other, faces alight with disagreement. A murmur of voices rises around the dwelling hearth until Alarhi, eyes shut tight, stomps the ground with force. Enough. Stillness. She waits until her brethren's voices die down before opening her eyes. You speak with long-sighted judgment. Trade strengthens all the tribes, and Renato's claim, false as it is, may spread the poison to us. May spread to poison us. We will suffer the indignity of letting this liar profit if it means safeguarding the peaceful, honorable accord of Twin Elms. Alari pulls up one sleeve, revealing a leather bag hanging from her hand. The clinking of copper fills the room. Take this back to the Valian with the blessings of the Fisher Crane tribe. Return to your Valian, Master Estramore. There's nothing further to discuss. Hey, I just pointed something out. I was not taking no fucking side. The looking inward chime. 35% experience. Palagina, it's you. Oh yeah, we've got a visitor we gotta deal with. I forgot. Already I forgot. Come down here. Renato. He smiles broadly and throws his arms in the air at our arrival. My friend, welcome back. Have you recovered my coin? Here it is. Diverus? Renato's eyes widen as his hands greedily snatch the purse. Perfetto, I had almost given up hope. Renato counts the coins, smalling at each clank of copper. My thanks to you, friend. With this, I can finally restock my wares. Come find me at the Celestial Sapling. I'm sure you can find some choice items for resourceful customers like yourself. Yeah, yeah. We make them mad. Fine. So it goes. Sometimes people are going to be mad at you. Maybe we should check his inventory, though. Oh, are we crashing? Where is the boy? Renato. Show me what you got. Bunch of traps. Not what we're looking for. We're looking for powerful weapons. Find the Deerwood and Expedition by the Pilgrim's Camp in the Northfield Wilderness. Where is the Expedition? Pilgrim Shrine, up here. The nest above the clouds. Travel to Helia's Temple. 
It's not here. This is the pilgrim's place. This is not where they are. It's not supposed to be there. No, oh, they're back. Where are the dudes? Where's the guys, the fellas? Ah, oh, here they are. Mercenary Captain Esmar. Stop, friend or foe. Man with blood-soaked armor points his blade at us as a wounded and weary comrades flock to position behind him. You're not Glenfathen. By Margarin, friend or foe, I said. Calm down, I'm a friend. A rare and welcome sight. Friends this far from home. He lets the weight of his sword lower his arm. He gives a concerned look at the mercenary company. Look at us, hiding in the rocks and holding in our guts. The fangs, they've bloodied us, and now we're trapped. Gwyneth sent me what happened. Resourceful girl, we assume the Glenfathens killed her before coming upon us. I'm relieved she's alive, doubly so she brought help. The tribesmen ambushed us just as we made camp. The fight was a lopsided slaughter. In the melee, someone tripped through the campfire. We were lucky in that regard. The stench of burning flesh and the choking smoke obscured the scene, and a few of us managed to withdraw. We ran to these ruins to regroup, but now we're trapped. The face painters are just south of our position, and they have us cornered. No doubt they're happy to let us starve while they rest and rebuild their strength before attacking anew. He's toying with unlocket around his neck. Seems this is where we make our last stand. At least you didn't lose your locket. Focusing on the positive, he asks with a laugh. This is for my son, when he's old enough to be trusted with such things. Born a few months ago, not hollow. Ilya be praised. Told my beloved child would want for nothing. He looks at the eye with an embarrassed smile. Probably should also have promised her that I wouldn't throw my life away of treasure hunting in Air Glanfoth. Here's hoping my boy gets his smarts from his mother's side of the family. If the hunters are to the south, can you flee to the north? We could run that way, maybe evade the Glenfothans if we're quick, but we spotted a pack of Stelgars up there. Given the options, I'd rather some face painter kill me right quick than die slowly, bite by bite, to a feral cat. If I didn't know better, I'd wager those beasts are working with the tribesmen, but I'm sure they're just here to follow their stomachs. Just look at you, limping on our injuries. Just look at us, limping on our injuries and covered in blood. Uh, I've dealt with the Stelgars. He blinks and arches his eyebrows in surprise. All of them? Hear that, boys? Looks like we've got a way out. Let's take it. They cheer, their voices kindled with purpose, and spring into march. As Mar raises his fist and shakes it, the locket dances if jerked to life. The captain nods and gives us one last look before joining his companions. Yeah, trespass is not really a mortal sin. Not a capital crime, in my opinion. Too many had to die anyway. You aided the mercenaries, foreigner. Now we will cleanse the stain you mark upon these lands. We should probably have just talked them away. Deer coming to fight us? Uh, sorry, Fangs. I thought we were friends. Praymaker. Um, let's go to. I don't know, should we go back and... How close are we to a level? Not not that close. Close, but not that close. Excuse me. What have we got? We did that. We've done that. 
Did our quest not update? Into the White Void, Champion of Bereth. Oh yeah, we gotta go to Redrick's Hall to deal with that. I'd rather get that level first, if possible. Servant of Death. Yeah, that one we can do without too much conflict, I think. Joop. Let's see. Should we go to Elm's Reach? Joop. It's time to deal with these fuckers. Be welcome, Estramore. Can we talk this motherfucker into sacrificing himself for some garbage? That would be convenient. Hey, rest in. Bareth wants you gone. Bareth believes it's time you paid your dues. He grunts. Then he can descend from his mighty pantheon and tell me himself. Oh, looks like we're going to have to just murder everybody. I'm okay with that. Uh, got a quick save there. Amplified wave. Oh, it targets an ally. Interesting. A servant of death. I wonder if we can rest in here. Because we're hurt. You can. Purgatory. Oops. Hello. You know, you don't all have to die for these fuckers. You're just the fucking supplicants. You thought this was going to lend your lives meaning? You were wrong. Or to end your lives meaning. Toast with another, uh, with another downing. So I suppose we should rest. We've lost reputation with Etiknol, but not with the community at large. This is like Abe, you know. Yeah, everyone agrees they kind of deserved it. There's not going to be anybody left to have reputation with, my friends. Whoa! How did they all explode like that? Oh, Alof's blast, I guess. a lot of death. 
More than was necessary, but uh, also maybe just the right amount. Why don't we deal with the elves for Rimmergand? I'm looking for the Frosthune Breach. The barest flush rises in her pale cheeks. As I said, only the shrine in the eastern wing is open. The rest of the temple is closed to visitors. Her cheeks flush, Watcher. Perhaps she misinterpreted what you meant by Frosthune Breach. Ooh. All right, so we're tasked with sealing it. He runs a hand over his neat beard. Again, I must focus. Please leave quietly if you don't mind. Rimmergan sent me to close the Frosthune breach. His red eyes widen. You are a man of compassion. Would you trap us here another hundred lifetimes? We can't continue like this. You've got to find a way into the White Void. Did he explain this to us? I don't think he did. The White Void. Rimmergan's domain. A place where all things are mingled like snowflakes in a blizzard. It's a vortex of such chaos that even the Beast of Winter himself could not calculate the trajectory of the infinite particles of essence there. The souls are broken down over successive reincarnations. They become part of the White Void. It is a place where all things find perfect unity and freedom. He glances at the ice-filled doorway. The frost breach is a weak spot in the barrier between us and the White Void. Thin ice on a frozen lake. We've come from the White that wends to find it. And you want to open the breach? so that we can die, permanently. We've lived more lifetimes than any mortal should. He shakes his head. We've been faithful followers of Rimmergan since our earliest incarnations. He's the god of entropy. Why would he force us to be reborn again and again? Aravius looks at Glossval solemnly, then looks at us. That rage sounds painfully familiar. Why did the god of seekers punish me for asking questions? Still, I wish I could give him peace, the peace while has shown me. The gods act in ways that are unknowable to us. To ascribe the motivations is to assume them to be folk, not gods. Better to accept in advance than to lament and stay stuck in one place. Glesval reaches toward the ice-filled passage, letting the foyers of cold wash over him. But if anything could pass through the frost breach, it would enter directly into the white void. This death is overdue for us. We just have to find a way through. Hmm. You can't oppose the will of a god. Tell me about you and your people. We call ourselves the Glomfellan. Most here know us as Pale Elves. We hail from the White that wends, a glacial continent on the southernmost edge of Aeora. We received a Watcher in our lands a season ago and paid her to tell us the origin of our souls. We wanted to contemplate the essence that fills us and consider how Rumor God might shatter and show us, uh, show us, so us, once our days are spent. He bows his head and presses his bloodless lips together. We were not prepared for what we learned. I don't think the Watcher was either. She explained that every one of us had been reborn whole into the clan over centuries, generations spanning back to the first days our people set foot on the white that wins. We had all been cut off from the mercy of our god promises. That night we began awakening, experiencing fragments of our past lives, old hatreds, dead passions, tangled memories. It illuminated nothing but the realization that we are doomed to live a thousand pointless lives, never closer to Rimikan's salvation. Alice's lips are pressed together, thin and bloodless. A dark expression hangs in his eyes. How did you con- how did he conclude those lives were pointless, or obvious ponders allowed behind us? Maybe Rimmergan showed them exactly what they asked, and they can't see the answer in front of them. I suppose when one seeks when they ought to listen, a leap of reasoning is to be expected. We want to die. We want Rimmergan to scatter our souls into the ether that a million fragments might join with the white void. He looks at his hands and a single frostbitten finger. My magic hasn't found a way through the frost breach yet, but there must be one. Uh, the problem is that the the breach is dangerous, and I would happily send them through it, but I also want to close it so it doesn't eat this community. So I'm going to have to say you can't oppose the will of a god. He laughs, but his eyes do not. You think that because Rimmergan spoke to you in a dream, you can march in here and tell us about his will, or that your elegant words will direct our faith? We followed him and suffered by him for almost as long as this temple has stood. Now we seek the very end that he promises. Do not lecture me about my duties to my god. If Rimmergan wishes for your souls to enter the white void, wouldn't he make it so? I don't pretend to understand his will, and neither should you. So we should live another hundred lifetimes of toil, in devotion to a god who will not even deign to give us a reason. He heaves a sigh, clouding the air between us. We've been faithful to Rimmergan all these generations, and even now it's his mercy we seek. And these centuries are but the blink of an eye to one who is eternal. 
He looks at the drawn, haggard faces of his people. If it's Remagon's will, we'll go back to the white that wins. Perhaps one day he'll reward our endurance. They turn to leave, shuffling through noon frost ice slick halls. Just damning a bunch of folks, nothing to see here, just... just damning them, but can't leave the breach open in the middle of a populated area. It would eat the town. That's not acceptable. Gained rep. Plug the hole with Remagon's shard. The shard fits perfectly. As it settles into place, the cold around the altar dissipates. Similarly, the portal before us seems to thicken and the mysterious seepage tapers off. Whoop. We did it. That's a wrap, folks. So what have we got? We got to deal with the dragon, and we got to kill the other ancient druid. That one may go a touch more sweetly. I think we could go find her immediately, but why don't we check in at the Golden Grove first, just so we don't waste any time. Is old. Oh, nope, nothing to say. So we gotta... Did you dream you'd live the life of an arcane practitioner as a kid? It was never my decision, but I've come to appreciate that it was made. It's reported in the Hearth Song. Where is she? Is she not here? We can't report in? So this quest is like weirdly incomplete? Incompletable? We did that. Huh. Oh, damn. She's in that area over there. She's not here. Like over this way, perhaps? Gwyneth? Is that you? No. Where is she? Cold darn it. There's where the dudes were. Oh, she's speaking. Over here, hurry. Where, where is she? I would love to hurry over here, Gwyneth, but where the fuck are you? Wolves! Around a campfire. That's where I'd hang out if I was wolves. Where are you, Gwyneth? Where? There she is. You did it. We'll be chanting your name back at the gift. Everyone will know what you've done for us, I promise. But you're the type to deserve more than just praise. Coin, weaponry, or share some skills. Give me the skills. When you spend as much time as I do in the ruins, you learn to strike first and without warning. The key is efficiency of movement. That increases our crit multiplier. Put your weight on the final step when you're ready to strike. I think you've got the grasp of it. I'm honored to teach you something new. Zoop, at the mercy of the tribes. Over to... Stormwall Gorge. Oh, we're going to run out of time here. We're going to make sure we go back to... Yes. Zoop. Spores! Bye. Should probably give Aloth some better armor. He seems to be dead all the time. zone. We need to go to Elmshore. We're going to be on the wrong side now. It's one of those songbirds down here at the Adra structure. Yes, it is. The Shardwing Songbird. 
Songs of the Wild. This naked man. Dead adventurer. Okay. He was, I guess he took off his clothes before he died. Where is the druid? Where is she? I thought that she was in this area here. I'm pretty sure she is. Maybe she's over this way. No. A dying monk. It's so cold. Please help me. Please help me. Help the man get to his feet. No, do not trouble yourself. This body is a ruined shell, but my soul will live on. That is all that matters. What happened? Forgetful, so careless. Cuts on my knuckles from this morning's practice. The Stelgers, they smelled the blood on me, thought they found their next meal. They were almost correct. You are known to us, Watcher. We know we have treated others honestly, fairly. I need someone trustworthy for my final mission. Um, tell me of your mission. This must be delivered to my order. Take it. It needs to be carried to the Celestial Sapling. Give this to my brothers. They will report it. Very, very carefully open the scroll case, attempting not to break the seal. Do not open it. Its contents are my brothers only. With a measured hand, we very slowly message to crack the message with seals. Each seal is open. Scroll contained within. Rejoice, seekers. The judicious application of pain has loosened the tongue of our informant. The artifact we seek has recently been moved to Elm's Reach. It should be secured in a residence near the entrance to the settlement. The informant suggested it is likely stashed away under the floor. We've endured much in our pursuits of this hallowed relic. Soon your efforts will come to fruition. The Council of Arch Martyrs awaits your triumphant return. Do not fail us. So they're like Andra, I guess? And they're looking for a relic? And they're torturing people to get it? That's not cool. That's not cool. Where is the lady, though? Maybe she's here? Maybe we did need to ask about it, even though it was already... Aha! She is here. Hi, Ovid Arona. The elf stands on a dais in the middle of a clearing. The ground is blanketed with leaves in various shades of russet and gold. Her eyes are closed and her arms folded in front of her. A curtain of autumnal yellow hair hangs in front of her face. As we draw near, she lifts her chin and looks at us with shifting hazel eyes. They brighten from dull brown to vivid green. Greetings, Estramore. Her voice is as sweet as a breeze sighing through trees. You are among the ovates of the Golden Grove. Aerith has sent me to end your life. It has continued for too long. Her mirthless laughter sounds against what, like water against, on that breaking on the rocks. And turn your turbulent passions against me, no doubt. What is a god that his voice should carry so far? And what are you that you should so eagerly obey? The gods only have dominion over what we seed, and you would seed matters of life and death to them. Durance laughs thickly with derision. The gods set the rules and let us do as we will, but that is merely a test. And only a fool thinks he has been seated anything. You do what your god wants, or you face the fire. This woman is about to become an example. It's that or trust your neighbors. If you had my neighbors, you might think twice about that. I didn't seed half my face to Galloway, and by choice, Aravius grumbles from beside us. A lot of typos in Aravius' dialogue. I wish your sentiment to be true, but agelessness has made her ripe with folly. The gods may be fickle and hard to know, but they are not constrained by our permissions. Are you any different? You've extended your life beyond its natural span. Through work and wisdom, the greater the tree, the more fruit it may yield. She nods at the ovates gathered in the clearing. They are vines climbing an ancient elm into a sun to the sunlight. My growth sustains them. Should our harmony fall prey to a god's jealousy? And what exactly would she lead them? She's blind to the limits of her own wisdom. Your growth stunts theirs. They learn nothing apart from you. This is what you demand to the other ovates. You're no different from the ethic knoll or the gods. A storm of protest brews behind her color-shifting eyes. She says nothing for several seconds, but we see the fury slowly drain from her face as her eyes fade to the brown of dead leaves. Finally, she lowers her head. Your words carry truth and shame. It was never my desire to diminish my followers, but I can see where perhaps my roots left no room for them to grow. Very well. If my season has ended, then let me pass with it. As she closes her eyes, the warmth and color drains from her body. Her breathing slows, her ashen skin stiffening with a dull patina. And the last sigh that leaves her lungs cracks carve... Another... When the last sigh that leaves her lungs cracks carve their way across her flesh, dividing it into hardened ridges, within seconds Arona is petrified, her bark-encrusted face turning toward the ovates below the dais. We did it. Solved Bareth's big problem.
she has become wood. That's all it took to, to get somebody who is hundreds of years old to accept death. It was a 15 resolve check. We gained reputation. Even with Etik Noel, I guess they were happy that she's gone. Uh, won't be enough to salvage our reputation with them. Let's go to Cadnua before that person leaves. Here we are. Odina. Not a moment. My lord, I don't wish to trouble you, but I could use your help in a personal matter. Very well, let's hear it. This is harder to say than I thought it would be. My name is Odena. I fought in the Saints' War, same as most of my kin. I followed orders no more, but between one thing and another, I guess I made a reputation for myself. They call me a hero. Every street I walk down, I get handshakes and comments. The dozens, they act like I'm some figurehead for their schemes. The things I've done, I don't get much sleep. The last thing I need is all this attention. I want some peace, please. You're the only one I could turn to. Sounds like you could use some rest. Head out into the woods, you mean? Won't find you in Defiance. I won't find rest in Defiance Bay. Seems like half my neighbors are in the dozens. You'll be less recognizable outside the Deerwood, and I'll give you some coin for the move. That's wow. I don't know what to say. Can't thank you enough. I'll gather my things, hire the first wagon out. Thank you, my lord. Of course. Just give money away to anybody who asks for it. Really, ten percent of our total wealth. What's that to us? What's that to us? Let's see if these druids. Fucking slaver just continually showing up. Should really have hanged that one that we got our hands on. Got anything new to say? What will the Ovates do now that Arona is gone? She lowers her head. That is unclear. Arona's passing has shown us the perils of leadership, even when authority is as benevolent as hers. Most of us became Ovates, so we wouldn't be shackled to the whims of a god. Some of us have questioned what it meant to elevate another as we did Arona. But it would mean... Cheetah and Rinwen. I have questions. Until we meet again, old one. Um, oh, we should have done Helia's quest. Oh well. Pray to Bareth. This must be the usher. Behind us is a woman, her skin milk pale against her black hair. She wears a suit of armor so dark it seems to suck the light from the stars. The road wind up a mountain behind her. The toll traveler and the pallid knight. Follow the pallid knight, pay the pallid knight. You drop a few coppers in her hand and she closes her fist around the coins. We instantly feel a small weight added to our purse. The lord of this road demands a toll of all, but he lends generously that all might travel this road again. Behind her the usher grips his lipless smile and waits. The road bores into the mountain and we find ourselves in a gigantic cavern. The ceiling curves up and away, and it's dotted with moisture. At this distance, the shining beads look like stars, clustered and scattered in constellations. The usher and the pallid knight lead us up a trail carved into the edge of the cavern. Two identical cave mouths wait up ahead, and we follow the usher to one of them. Standing at the edge and gazing down, we see an endless, ever-changing plain bisected by a road. Only then do we realize that we're no longer on the road. As we follow the road to the point where it disappears below us, we realize we're standing in the eye sockets of a massive skull. The usher points to the road. Archdruid raced and appears before us. He's just as we remember him, stern and smooth skin. Yet with each step along the road, he grows, swelling with blood and essence. His heavy steps become slower and slower until he stops altogether. His distended body fills the path completely. The pallid knight's voice is low and soft. You met a dwarf traveling this road. What did you do? He had lived many centuries. I brought him a new life. Ah. Uh... He lived on the blood of others. I saw justice done. You are too impatient in your ideals. There is no justice in the tides that move the seas, nor in the seasons that nurture and slay all growing things. There is no morality in the forces that move the world. They are inevitable, products of their own self-perpetuating motion. As raced and swollen body ruptures, the effect is like a dam bursting. Ghostly figures, as hazy and indistinct as wisps of smoke, continue along the cleared path. Some tumble and rush along while others amble and drift, but all continue forward. The usher directs our attention to another figure moving down the path. This time we see High Ovate Arona. As she follows the road, her movements become slow and erratic. Her legs creak at each step, and her feet grow long, thick roots that burrow into the ground. 
She finally stops, rooted in place. You found a tree that had lived for centuries. Its roots were deep and its boughs sheltered many. Why did you cut it down? Trees don't belong in the road. I thought that if I cleared the tree, maybe the lord of the road would grant me a boon. I tired of this tree's endless riddles. It was a parasite. While its branches sheltered others, its roots sucked them dry. All draw their life's energies from the deaths of others. This is why all must remain part of the cycle of death and rebirth. No creature may be a closed loop unto itself. Arona's body petrifies below, and the shimmering leaves of her hair blow down the path. You seek another who has lived his lives on the brink of the cycle. He sits on the inside of the wheel, observing its revolutions. With each life, he is plucked from the stream and returned to it intact. Why do you hunt Theos? He's entrapped thousands of souls for Whittaka. I'm going to stop him from giving her absolute power. If you know this much, then another god has already spoken with you, and given you half of the answer. Theo serves Wudiga. She desires an escape from her own cycle, power without decline. Theos has removed thousands of souls from the cycle so that their essence might empower her. The black depths of her eyes threaten to swallow us. You must stop him, and you must return him to the cycle. What end would it serve to send the souls back into the cycle? Attending to these souls is a question of stability, Watcher, of maintaining the natural order of the world and the ebb and flow of essence. Couldn't they be returned to the Hollowborn? As battered, burdened things, do you mix soured wine with fresh? The kindness you seek lies in giving them a new beginning, not in shackling them to this life. If Theos meddled with these souls, perhaps it would be better to destroy them. The cycle is merciless, but it is not wasteful. Time and the endless procession of rebirths eventually grind souls into dust, but until then, they must pass from the world and return to it. Their continuing movement advances the cycle itself. Cycles are changeless and monotonous. Surely there's a better alternative. The illusion of revolution? It is merely part of another cycle, and a painful one. True change has structure, geometry. It is the product of cycles within cycles, a thousand gears spinning and moving the universe by degrees. What's wrong with Wudiga seizing power? The cycle of Kith is a thing of balance. Likewise, it is the cycle of the gods. We rise and fall in favor of mortals, only to fall and rise again. But Wudiga seeks the power and place herself outside of this cycle. She would root herself and grow to the detriment of others. The usher silently gestures to the road where a broken tree and husk of flesh are still visible. I think I understand. I only show you the motion of the universe, Watcher. Why does Wudika even need Theos' help? And why do you need mine, for that matter? The gods guide souls through more, more, guide souls through the cycle of death and rebirth, but Aora is the domain of mortals. You stand aside, waits and counterweights. Were one to alter the tides of Kith, all would follow. We would rip this world from its axis. That is why Wudika directs a mortal to do her bidding, and why any who would stop Theos must be mortal as well. I don't see what this has to do with me. Theos builds a dam to divert water from a stream. The flow of thousands of souls will shape the world you live in, Watcher. It will also shape the world your soul returns to, when next it lives. I must go to Sun and Shadow now. No mortal can survive the descent into the pit, but there are souls on the burial isle that are pledged to me. I will grant them to you, and they shall bear you down safely, as well as light the way beyond. A multitude appears on the other end of the road, raising their voices and kicking up dust as they make their way toward us. Return them to the cycle, Watcher. Promise that you will, and I shall give you power befitting a champion of death. She raises a finger. Accept my favor, though, and I will demand this decision as your due. I collect from all mortals in time. I'm going to talk to the other gods. Do not delay long, Watcher. What Theo seeks you can to do cannot be undone, even by the turning of the wheel. The usher points behind us, and we return. Levels all around, sort of. Stray! What can you gain? Just Amplified Wave. Boring level. Boring level. Um, it's not much of a much. It's gonna just, like, get a... Increase my health. It'd be great to just have bonus health. Why is he not using his crossbow, by the way? Have we taken our weapon focus with our crossbow? I think... I think we have. Arquebus. It's not an arquebus, is it? That we've been using? It might be an arc. No, an arquebus is a gun. 
An arquebus is a gun. This... Oh, it's an arbalest. That's what it was. So did we take the right one for arbalest? Amplified wave. No, we did not. We took the wrong one. Well, that was foolish of us. Gunner. Oh, plus 20% reload speed. Yes. Yes. Uh-huh. We're taking that one. Forever faster, please. Ever and forever faster. Hopefully it all stacks. Hell off. Uh, Death Ring was the one we were tempted to get, I think. Any bonus spells? No. Defensive, utility, deep pockets. It increases corrosion damage that he deals. This would be useful if we had more of a focus, if we were more aware of what kind of damage we were doing. Um, but we're not really, we haven't been that intentional about things. Unstoppable, is there really no, no, uh, oh well, plus six shield deflection, shield deflection bonus applies to reflex. We should give that one to Adair. Uh, and probably to, uh, endurance. There's fortitude. Plus one enemies in cage, that's useless to us, plus ten will. That's useful for dragon fighting. Uh, what kind of weapon is he using? Is he using a scepter or a rod? This is a scepter. So we'll just take that one. Why not? It's corrode damage. Adventurers, nobles are good with scepters and rods. Not enough. Uh, where's the sword and shield style? You might already have it, for all I know. Oh no, here it is, weapon and shield style, sweet. It's gonna gain six defense straight up, and reflex as well. Both very good. Same deal here? Yeah, I don't really care about that bonus first level spell. Give him the weapon and shield style. There we go. And now Rimmer Guns. Did we get a reward for that? A fine robe. Oh, we got a tiny beetle. Thanks, tiny beetle. Put Pad's hood? I don't think that was a gift from the gods. We never did find the first the Deerwood. Oh, we've heard enough about the Broken Stone War. Oh, we never changed Bleshka's labor out either. He was not armed, because we got rid of his weapon and never replaced it. Whoops. Whoops. Please use the correct weapon. Just throw that away. You can never... What happened to that, uh... Was it a belt of plus two dexterity? Did we end up putting that on somebody? Yes, we gave it to him. I think we've already got a dexterity bonus on over here, right? Yeah, dexterity plus three on the champ. Um, good. Crater Remagand. A man emaciated and almost naked huddles at the beast's legs. His body is scored with lash marks and his nose and ears have been carved from his face. His black eyes pierce the white out by the wheel. It's Scan. The Oroch stops and stands before us, enveloping us in its violent blizzard that surrounds it. Though its mouth does not move, the beast speaks in a deep, thunderous voice. A clan of Glamfelon ventured from the white that wends to find the crack in the ice. When you sealed it, you damned their souls to a slow, weathering healer, on one they had sought to escape. Their recklessness endangered the rest of Old Song. For each there is a season watcher. Winter's shroud covers all things in its time. The heat and energy of life dissipates, and untethered essence fades into chaos. But entropy is a chisel of ice and a hammer of wind. It is not for mortals to wield these tools. The scarred man snickers. The world shudders beneath us, and a great crack echoes across the white expanse. The ice splits at our feet, waves lapping through the rift. A low, melancholy voice rises from the depths. The watcher seeks something lost. What is it you search for? 
the thousands of souls that Theos has stolen for Whitaker. Rimmergan's deep, slow voice echoes across the glacier. Theos has removed those souls from the cycle, their ice melting in the sun. Let them fade, waves crash in agreement. Let them forget this world and be forgotten by it. Skaen grins, still huddled next to the one, one of the beast's woolly legs. Take the souls she so desires and grind them into dust. Let her see her careful schemes thoroughly ruined. The last one sounded a little nastier than the other two. For several seconds, the waves wash quietly against the ice and the aurochs stand silently amidst the churning flurries. It is the destiny of all things to crumble and to join the chaos that follows this world. Some seek it willingly, as you have seen. To mingle, roiled and stirred by the tides of the universe, it is not an unkind fate. You would give those souls the very fate you sought to deny the Glumfellan pilgrims. The Orox snorts, I am the beast of winter. I neither speed nor alter my path for the whims and desires of Kith. I take souls at the time of my choosing, be it moat by moat or in a sudden tempest of chaos. The waves rise, besieging us. These souls, they have already forgotten their place in the world. They have been lost to existence. Let them be memorialized and mourned for an age, and then forgotten entirely. Why do you oppose, Wudaga? The Orox shakes its hoary mane, exposing its prominent ribs. She desires the order to order chaos and shackle the agents of change in the world. Under her, all things would remain static and frozen according to her laws. Even now, she only barely keeps the pact of the gods to leave the affairs of Kith in mortal hands. She moves in Theos, where she cannot move directly. Skaen's laughter is thin and shrill. And so we call on you to do the same. Such are the schemes of the queen that was. I'll seek Theos in sun and shadow. When you reach the burial isle, we will send lost souls to guide you through the pit. This is our gift to you. What, do you, what you do after you face Theos will be your choice, but we would have you, have you set the stolen essence adrift. The beast advances. And whether you would heed us or no, understand that our end comes to all things eventually. Help us achieve it, and we shall reward you now with the power to rival Theos. But do not choose lightly. You forget nothing, least of all betrayal. I will talk to the other gods. Do not wait forever. We wait, but Theos does not. Rimmergon continues toward us, swallowing us with a blinding, deafening snowstorm. We are experiencing a dizzying, exhilarating disorientation, oblivious to the landscape around us and even the reality of our own body. We hear a noise that could be the shrieking winds or Skaen's screeching cackle, and then it recedes with everything else. Rimmergon reappears in the distance, trudging away from us, and the whiteout follows him. As the vision of snow fades, it leaves in its wake the flagstones of Tyr Evren. Yoop. We have not dealt with Hylias yet, because we forgot to do that. Let's see what awaits us up here. Confront the beast. I'd rather hope we'd be sneaking up on it. Sweet mother of Galloway, that's an impressive beast. Think we can slay it? Right, what's the plan again? We reach the summit. Meaning is utterly clear, vermin invading my nest. Be careful, watcher, her mind is on an edge. I've been sent to get you to leave so that Helia's worshippers may return. Oh, okay. It doesn't like that. She's mad. Which one is prayer against fear? Halt, holy meditation, prayer against fear. Right there. Jesus. Uh, I think we can mind control these plights, can't we? I mind control all of them. With our many whispers of treason. Can he reach? Yeah, I got a couple of them. Oh no, breath weapon. Uh, that was bad. Unfortunately, she is just burning down over here. Yeah, it's not going well for her. Um, disintegrate her.
Boom. Uh, well, I don't feel good about that, necessarily. About simply murdering her when she has eggs here. Will break her. Oh, it's a grimoire. Books. Uh, where's her egg? Ooh. Godenstirner. It's just fine. Uh. Oh, a plus three might. Damn. I think that protagonist already has a plus some might thing on, doesn't he? Yeah, he's already got a plus three might. Give it to him. I'll give it to Aloth would be wiser, or even the Grieving Mother, since she's got those high-level Cypher spells as well. Uh, let's save real quick. And see if there's a more equitable solution to this. Zoop. Da, 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 da. You have young here. Ilya is a goddess of motherhood, actually. Is that why you came here? Then you should stay. Raising your offspring here would honor Ilya. Uh, nah, nah, sorry, dragon. You're, uh, if you fucking stayed away, sure. But you, you can't be here like that. You're gonna murder your way through too many kith. I cannot allow this. I cannot approve. I think Hylia does approve if you spare her. Because of the presence of the dragon younglings, I, I believe that is the case. But, um... I tend to take the kith side in things. I seek an audience with Hylia. Whistle to the bird. We whistle the first tune that pops into our head. The sparrow blinks its beady eyes and hops closer to us along the branch. It bobs its tiny head and opens its beak in the rich, trilling melody that spills forth as the song of a chorus of birds. A massive flock descends with the thundering of wings and whooping, screeching, chirping calls. They fill the boughs of the tree by the thousands, birds of every shape, size, and color nesting next to one another. A breeze ripples through the air, cloaked by furry feathers. Uh, a glimpse of someone looking back at us. Watcher, I believe we stand in the legendary court of birds. I feel a presence, warmth, and hope. You journeyed to my temple and got rid and rid of the dragon. Now my faithful may return, singing their joy to the skies and praising me through their creation. I just wanted to kill a dragon, no. Life is creation and celebration. I'm glad to have served you in this. A breeze blows through the tree. A dove tucks its head into its feathers and watches us. Glad because you seek to protect life, or because you seek a patron, and yet you are proving yourself with this task, I would tell you of another. I already know that Theos Arcanon has gone to Sun and Shadow to strengthen Woodica with the thousands of souls. The birds return to the tree and nestle among their peers. The breeze ripples to the branches again, carrying the goddess's voice. Then you have earned the favor of another, but stopping Theos will not heal the dear wood. You must guide the trapped souls back to the bodies they were stolen from hollow-born children whose eyes have never seen the sun. The grieving mother claps her hands once, setting off the music of chimes. After long years, let their wounds be healed, their tears dried. You could restore them, give their families hymns of joy after years of lament. You could restore them, give their families hymns of joy after years of lament. The breeze tickles our ear. Peace and restoration give purpose to suffering. There is no meaning, no redemption in pain that does not lead to fulfillment. Symmetry demands that great rejoicing follow great suffering such as this. I'm not sure it's possible to truly undo the harm Theos has caused. We hear the cry of a swift, soft, and plaintive. Perhaps the years cannot be forgotten, and for some, perhaps it is already too late. But if you could restore even one soul, kindle one spark of life, raise one voice in joy, it would be worth it. There's another side to this. You've seen the consequences of a soul disjointed from its own cycle. Could these children ever truly return? Perhaps it would be better to allow these souls to find new lives. The grieving mother gapes at us in horror. Give them first these lives, Watcher. Let them know the love of parents who waited for them, tended them, 
and let their return bring healing to the dear wood. How can they continue to another when they have not fully lived this life? To pass them along to another now is cutting a stanza from a poem, a verse from a song. Thank you, Ilya. I will continue to sun in shadow. When you reach the burial aisle, you will find souls there that I have granted reprieve for their sins. I give these to you, for only they can bear you safely on your journey down. And when you face Theos and the rotting fruits of his endeavors, remember the conversation we have had. In that moment, you will have power rivaling a god's, and after it, you will live in the world that you have chosen. Choose restoration, Watcher. Return the souls to the bodies they were stolen from. Swear to me that you will do this, and I shall give you power to make even Wudaka quake. Great wings, dark against the sun, unfold behind the tree, casting a blinding shadow across the temple for the briefest of moments. I can be merciful and terrible, Watcher. The grieving mother's eyes are fever bright. Watcher, this is the hope I have held to. The children of the Deerwood might be restored, their families healed. Let us bring Hylia's restoration to this country. I swear to return the souls to the hollow-born children of the Deerwood. And I shall remember. The dark wings snap shut and the tiny sparrow flits to our shoulder. It tilts its head back and opens its beak. And the song that spills forth is like nothing we have ever heard. Melodies at once mournful and beautiful entrance us. The world becomes a place of pure color and sound. Each perfect moment follows the next like lines in a poem or the bar of a song. We awaken as if from a dream, standing in Tyr Everin. Elia's song and the power of her blessing follow us still. And so we have dealt, treated with each of the gods. And uh, we received a boon from one of them because we weren't willing to make promises to all of them. Where is it? Plus one lore, plus one perception? That's what she gave us? Plus one lore and plus one perception? That's the power to make Wudaka tremble? Well, okay then. There's Dungeon Delver, that's what we got from there. I mean, the reward we got from the girl we met in a bar is a better boon than Hilia fucking granted us. What the fuck? All right, well, we've sworn our oath. And Wael continues to simply giggle. The page unturned added the quest expires in one day. Council of Stars. A place of great silence. Uh, whoops, we didn't look at what the reward for that was. Hopefully nothing we'd really want. Redrick's Hold. A vampire. As we approach the smiling woman at the side of the road, we are stuck with a sense of unease. At this distance, we can see that her skin has a sickly pallid sheen to it, and her eyes are the glassy milk white of a cadaver. Her expression sits odd on her face, as if it requires great effort to maintain. Lord Radrick has been expecting you. The woman smiles a little wider. It is good that you have not refused his challenge. He feared you might prove a coward in the end. I will escort you to him if you wish. What are you? A loyal servant granted a boon for her good service. Like my lord, I will persist beyond the cycle and walk an eternity upon the earth. Seek answers from him directly if you want them, sure. Come then. He waits for you there. Spooky. Lord Redrick waits for you upon the tower. Right back in his same old haunt, huh? Maybe? Or was he... Was he up there? Set upon the tower, what does that mean? Isn't there a way up here? Are you in here, Redrick? Oh, he was out there, Nedmar. Nedmar seems frailer than ever, his wrinkled skin stretched thin over old bones. He blinks repeatedly on seeing us as if to clear his vision. You've returned. You do not know what horrors have fallen upon this keep. Lord Redrick has forsaken his faith and clings to unnatural life creates other monsters in mimicry of Osiris' teachings, he sags. It is only because she is gone that I have been able to convince Redrick to allow me to stay, to try and steer him back onto the path. But I fear he is beyond reach. Then Mar points a trembling hand toward the vaulted ceiling. He is waiting up at the tallest point of the keep. You can reach it from the upper floor. I will leave this place and go where I am needed. Perhaps I can find Jocko and he will consider returning to the church. Elsewhere, he bows his head. I wish you luck, my friend. Please, put an end to this. 
Yeah, it's bad out there. A confrontation under the clear sky, then? Ah, yes, indeed. You got a burning head? An armored figure strides forward. In place of its eyes, great flames burn, emanating heat and light. In that orange glow, we can see the face beneath us succumb to rot. The cheeks sunken, the lips pulled back over gray gums and decaying teeth. But it is unmistakably Redrick who stands before us. Look well, Redrick's voice has gained a scratchy quality but retains its stolid arrogance. See what you have made of me, but see to what Great Bareth has permitted. I am returned, mind and soul, that I might be avenged upon my allies, my enemies. I have come to meet your challenge, Redrick, and I am glad for it. I have sent servants forth to observe your progress. I feared your soft heart might falter, but you have proven your valor in this, at least. I have strangled the life from the usurper cult with my own hands. So fell your champion, your great hope. Is that creature to be your thane? A man without resolve, without aim, a leech growing fat upon the veil, senseless to the ravages his vanity inflicted upon his people. Almost sounds as bad as the alternative. I will not allow my lands to fall into ruin. I will cleanse the scattered god's poison from the blood of my people. I will scour his name from the deer wood. Earth has blessed me with its favor, and I will be its sword. There will be no more mercy for the heretic, the thief, the charlatan. All will be met with death. I too have received the twin god's favor. We are both champions of death. For a moment, Redrick hesitates, and then he raises his blade in salute. And fight well. We shall see which of Bareth's champions proves the victor. He ran the other way. Can I pull just some of them? That'd be amazing. No, it appears not. Uh, I got your lightning spell. The lightning spell's pretty cool. Shaboom! And that's loud. Uh, you got your... Still working on it. I guess he actually can do this now, can't he? Uh, just needs to target an ally. Oof, knock everybody over. Crush the one of that guy. So we want you. Got some more juice in us. Knockdown. Oh, that's so loud. <laughs> well, it's not as loud on the recording as it is here. Oh. I don't know if he just went down and the lightning's still going. Maybe he just went down. Hey, what are you doing, man? Save your bros. Save your boys. Disintegrate him. He's not disintegrating. He's still not disintegrating. I can't disintegrate him? Oh, I don't like standing so close to him like that. Yikes. Dong. No problem. Levels for the laggards. He carries many scars. Defiant, regeneration, and fine. Eh. I don't think so. There's a secret up here. Keep of withdrawal, disengagement, defense bonus. We shouldn't be disengaging if we can avoid it. It is true, then. You have been graced with Bareth's favor. A great champion of the Lord of Death. Greater than he whom I served. I would serve you loyally, my lord, if you would have me. What power I hold would be yours to command. No, sorry, you need to eat kids to live. That's not happening. What power you have is going down the fucking drain. Sorry, I'm on Kith's side. I think we've established that by now. Alright, to round out the episode, we are going to... Uh, take one more attempt on the Andra Dragon. Oh, we got a prestigious visitor as well. Let's see what he's got to say. 
Probably do our levels as well. This is a boring level, right? Not oh, boring fourth level spell, sure. Sometimes we cast with Robius, sometimes. Lord Sidrock. Ah, it's good you're here. I simply must speak with you, my lord. As I'm sure you're well aware, wealth has a way of birthing enemies. My fortress is beset by thieves. I'm sure one of the lesser nobles is after my treasury. This has the stink of jealousy on it. It will be weeks before I can secure my holdings, and by then it will be too late, and I haven't the connections to hire mercenaries on short notice. Is there anything you can do? Make a stand, defend your keep. I'll see to it these jealous rivals are dealt with. Uh, may I ask is your intentions? I'll have missives sent to every noble in my lands. Letters, my lord. Do you think that's sufficient? We can't afford to be at each other's throats. I'm sure these nobles will see reason. Of course, forgive me for ever doubting you. We are blessed to have someone so sensible ruling Cadnua. Don't really care that much about the internecine squabbles of nobles. One rich asshole or another. Last thing the deer would need is another foreign colony. What does that mean? I must say I'm impressed. Uh, plus three might to everybody? How about that? We feel a presence hovering nearby. When we turn, we see the grieving mother observing us. Concern crinkles the corners of her eyes and seeps into our mind. You were a call of your own, Watcher. I see you shrouded by old lives and unanswered questions. Can you see any details of my past lives? I'm sorry. Whatever secrets your soul hides are not present in your mind. Yes, I've felt them more and more of late. This is why we journey together. That one may draw strength from many, and that much may be mended by the purpose of one. Your obscure past, does it trouble you? Yes, I don't know what's in there, and that troubles me. Take care, Watcher. Do not let the unknown chapters of your soul thwart your present endeavors. You must fortify your mind and find clarity in your purpose. Oh, she's still got a level to think. But it's also a boring one. Mind Plague. Um, we given her the focus with a hunting bow? Of course, the hunting bow is not a viable weapon down here, but... Eh. As beautiful as it can be with the absence of children. Not as beautiful as being within ruins in my home, but your fortress is impressive in its own little way. Uh, let's just make a save up here, because it's annoying to walk back out. Before dragon. And now we walk down. We walk down. We walk down. Down. And we've walked down. We hadn't killed the Adrigans, huh? Hopefully they still don't aggro. Nice. That should clear matters up. Oh shit, we don't have a, a bait anymore. We're gonna have to use our friend as bait. Have to use a character instead of uh, a disposable. Ding dong, mind your step, little thief. I'm minding it. Minding it all the way to the bank. Uh, you, grab the champion. You, do you have Whispers of Treason? Grab the High Priest. Everybody else should just find somebody to attack. Adair. Simply get hold of this dragon's attention. Ouch. But he's gonna recover, that's fine. They will keep attacking down there, right? Because they've all got AI turned on? Build up a bunch of juice for our, the ciphers. He's fully recovered from his damage. Oh, we didn't put on the, the breath weapon defense hat, damn it. We might give it two attempts. Oh, whoa. Well, there goes Adair, but he's back on his feet. No, 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 Adair. Fuck. Disengage is brutal. Quickly, quickly. Quickly, quickly, I said. Okay. All right, so that's all handled now. <laughs> so to speak. 
Adair, you've got so much recharge time going on right now. Where do you get that big heal from? V6. Okay, alright. Now, it begins in earnest. Adair... No, 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 no. We need Adair to be tanking so that the breath weapon doesn't destroy us. Okay, now everybody make sure you're well out of the line for the breath weapon. So you're in flank. Are we flanking? Oh, shit. Damn it! <laughs> the breath weapon. Um, no, disintegrate. Didn't work. Paralyzed him, though, for a long time. I can disintegrate the mountain head. There we go. Finally, it lands. F6. Damn, he can't heal them both. The Outer Dragon is almost dead. Okay, we've done pretty well here. Hey! Finally, we were just able to burst her the fuck down. Audra Dragon. A full-grown dragon is colossal, taller than most buildings of kith construction when at rest. It can easily rise to twice that height when rearing up on their hind legs. Dragons have reached the mature stage in their life cycle. Like drakes, they've adapted to fit in their environment, but even more extensively. Their coloration, ornamentation, even body structure will reflect their chosen territory, as will the attacks and defenses they can bring to bear. Because they've already claimed territory and rarely face a threat from other dragons or drakes, they are more conservative in nature and will not necessarily unnecessary not seek unnecessary conflict. Only dragons can mate. This is generally the only occasion that will cause a dra I don't know what that means. That will cause a dragon to leave its lands or seek others of its kind. Upon reaching a dragon stage, these creatures will assume a sex. However, if surrounding populations are too heavily skewed one way or the other, individual dragons can change their sex. As creatures that reach this stage are so rare, this ability is critical to the survival of the species. Dragons are more intelligent than most other sentient beings, but their solitary nature prevents them from interacting meaningfully with other species. The Celebrant's Dirge added, We did it. We killed the Andra Dragon. I wonder if there's anything over here that she was protecting as she accused us of being thieves. Doesn't look like it. Oh yeah, there is a horde. Reliable, overbearing, and superb. Uh, well, I'm not going to replace that. Maybe the Grieving Mothers. Ooh, a crossbow. That might be good for the Grieving, grieving Mother as well, actually. Predatory and superb. Retaliation sneak attack bonus and superb. That's pretty cool. Recovery speed only minus 20%. Might be worth it for uh, our hero. Throw it on the protagonist. It'll be a little bit less offensive, but a little bit sturdier. And he'll get that damage bonus to compensate. He's cute. I wonder if you can enchant it to... Uh... Oh, we could enchant it to give us a boost to our stats, but we've already kind of got a lot of that going on. There is a way that you can make armor lighter, but it's a very, very late game. Hey, Minalata's Grimoire. You should definitely copy out of that. Adraban, that seems very rare. Little Savior, Preservation Herald, and Superb. Plus five to all defenses of friendly aura. Damn. Shield deflection. Can you give that one to Durance, maybe? Zoop, zoop. 93. We bury our arm to the shoulder and we still haven't reached the bottom of the pile. Yes. All it took was a superheroic character who could bring fuck tons of damage to bear. And also the two two of the adds being willing to die ahead of time. That was also convenient. But we did it, folks. We've killed like uh, one of the harder encounters in the game. There's only one encounter probably that remains that can be a challenge and it's just another dragon fight so that remains to be seen but this episode is now far far too long and i will see you soon